Now a House hearing on the Obama administration's proposal to create a new Consumer Financial Protection Agency. It would assume responsibilities held currently by several different agencies. Bobby Rush of Illinois chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. This is about three hours, 20 minutes. The Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade and Consumer Protection will now uh, come to order. The purpose of today's hearing is to hear witnesses um, on the subject of the proposed Consumer Financial Protection Agencies, uh, Agency, uh, implications for the consumers and the FTC. And I certainly want to welcome all the witnesses, uh, Mr. Barr and Chairman uh, Libowitz. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues uh, and all the witnesses who diligently worked to prepare a testimony over the uh, 4th of July holiday uh, so that, there, that today's hearing would be as meaningful as possible as we commence our examination of the administration's proposal to create a new, financial, a, a new consumer financial protection agency. Uh, my view on the matter is fairly straightforward. I believe that the FTC uh, should remain intact as it is currently constituted, and that this committee and subcommittee should continue to oversee and authorize the F FTC. The, uh, the commission, which was established in 1914 during our nation's progressive era, was designed to be a regulatory agency with disinterested expertise to ensure competition and to promote free enterprise. That mission and those prescient concerns are as vital today as they were almost a century ago. The commission operates best as a long eagle. From high above, the agency can survey the marketplace and swoop down on predators that, that deceive unsuspecting and misinform consumers. The higher and farther away that the FTC is from other agencies and the entities that it regulates, the better it is at spotting unfair commercial and trading practices and at isolating those practices that cast the longest shadows. Similarly, by staying at a distance, the agencies can keep would-be credit captors at bay while I stand on course to achieve its critical mission of protecting consumers. Looking at all reliable indicators, the Commission has performed commendably for small and scrappy staff and abridged powers. Working along with a five-person bipartisan commission are approximately 1,100 dedicated employees spread out across three bureaus, Bureau of Competition, Consumer Protection, and Economics. Although its expertise is, is deep and broad, the FTC's statutory tools under the FTC Act consist of an antiquated and cumbersome form of rulemaking under the Magnuson-Moss Act paired with anemic litigation authority. These tools may be successful at land, landing glancing blows, but they fail to pack the full punch of deterrence that businesses will respect and consumers deserve. Currently at the FTC's disposals, disposal are its expertise and its agency crafted instruments of research and policy and study development, consumer complaint and education, competition, legal analysis, and economics. 
what the FTC does well and has done without pure relative to its sister agencies. And what it hasn't done particularly well is well in the process of being fixed. Just a few weeks ago, our subcommittee worked intently to mark up H.R. 2309, the Credit and Debt Protection Act, which directs the FTC to, to adopt rules using APA rulemaking authority that would address rampant, unfair, and deceptive acts and practices in the area of payday lending, automobile finance, mortgage and foreclosure rescue, and debt settlement. Our subcommittee's objective in passing H.R. 2309 was to confer more authority upon the FTC and equip it with sufficient resources so that it could adopt rules faster in the areas of credit and debt through APA rulemaking procedures and bring enforcement action incurring the threat of civil penalties. Our committee has worked devotedly in the past more than a few times with members from the Financial Services Committee to bolster the FTC's shortcoming, hold out the FTC's best practices for banking agencies to emulate in protecting consumers and to improve the ability of bank regulatory agencies to protect consumers by ensuring unfair and deceptive rules under the FTC Act. I have witnessed the respective chairs of the committees on energy and commerce and financial services jointly introduce H.R. 3525 to tackle some of these challenges. Further, I offered a friendly amendment to H.R. 3526, which was introduced by the Chair of the Financial Services Committee in the 110th Congress to, acquire, to require that a GAO report investigating federal banking and credit union regulations and the perpetuation of unfair and deceptive acts and practices by the depository institutions. Importantly, this push and pull between our respective committees has pressured the providers of financial services and products, including banks and depository institutions, to balance the allure of profits and determination of safety and soundness against the needs of consumers. This collaborative working relationship between committees has produced good and accessible consumer protection bills to safeguard consumers of financial services and uh, consumer credit products. It is a viable example of the independent agencies that will be affected by the administration's proposal as it will allow each of them to maintain their independence and respective biases, experience, and expertise when addressing serious problems that cut across industry sectors and affect market suppliers and consumers. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today, for taking out the time from their busy schedule to be uh, and to participate in this hearing. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, California, the uh, ranking member, Mr. Rodonovich, for five minutes for the purposes of the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I appreciate uh, your calling today's hearing on this important topic. Whenever something goes wrong in this country, Washington proposes a solution, regardless of whether the situation calls for one. However, well-intentioned well our actions, they rarely work out because they are often undertaken as a knee-jerk response. We have seen many unintended consequences of rushed legislation in recent history. For example, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. <clears throat> At best, we have seen marginal improvement in the markets while diverting billions of dollars toward new compliance costs to the detriment of many small and medium-sized businesses. In another example, last Congress, we enacted a law in response to lead paint on toys. The paint violated an existing standard, but what was a compliance problem rather than a, a deficient standard problem led to numerous costly new mandates that put many small and medium-sized business, businesses out of business because the cost was too high without any corresponding increase in safety. This is not to say that weaknesses in our financial system don't exist. They obviously and clearly do. The, the failure of so many financial institutions and the ongoing problem of foreclosures on mortgages some borrowers never should have taken out are evidence of that. 
And if the bailout of banks and financial firms really were necessary to save the financial system, something clearly needs to be done to address the systematic risk. Additionally, fraud and deception by both lenders and borrowers in the mortgage market ran rampant. The FBI reported an increase in fraud by more than 400 percent since 2005. Few people questioned anything was wrong in the market until home prices started plummeting and borrowers began defaulting. If uniformity in the enforcement of existing laws can address these problems, I would support that. Apart from the lack of systemic risk regulator to prevent future financial collapses required in the taxpayer bailout, I am still trying to understand what holes exist in the FTC's Consumer Protection Authority and to what extent the government contributed to the crisis with its intervention in housing policy. <clears throat> I am far from convinced that the market problems require the creation of a new federal regulator as contemplated by the administration's proposal. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are under government control in part because they did exactly what Congress and the government wanted, extend home ownership to as many people as possible under the watch of the federal regulators. Fannie and Freddie, along with the federal housing agencies and programs, were encouraged to extend credit, and when they did, they and their shareholders paid the price for failing. To accomplish the policy goal of extending home ownership to as many people as possible, changes in lending standards had to occur. The lowering of lending standards meant more borrowers qualified for loans they couldn't afford. My point is that laws on the books didn't stop people from taking out riskier mortgages, either in spite of or because of rapidly increasing home prices. Nor has it stopped regulators and law enforcement from prosecuting those who we know, now know committed fraud and broke the law. While many experts believe that the banking regulators performed their duties inadequately, I will leave that to the Financial Services Committee to decide. But with regard to the FTC, it seems to me that we are throwing out the baby with the bathwater by stripping the authority over consumer protection for financial products and services from the one agency that has performed well. If we agree we need legislation, we should take the approach of legislating with a scalpel rather than with a bulldozer. With that said, I have two primary concerns with this proposal. First, it creates a new federal entity with an enormous scope of authority. The proposal grants sweeping authority to a new agency over financial products that would cover every sector of the economy. As I understand it, the draft legislation would touch everyone from a certified public accountant to a realtor and subject them to, new tax, to a new tax to fund the agency. Second, I'm concerned about transferring functions from the FTC to a new agency without any evidence that it is necessary or that will, it will be as effective as a regulator as the FTC is. By removing the FTC's authority, we could lose the FTC's unique expertise in balancing consumer protection and competition. Finally, the legislation contains several new broad authorities for the FTC regarding rulemaking authority and civil penalty authority. I have previously disagreed with these and do not need to repeat them at this time. However, I do have some questions of the witnesses regarding these provisions and I will ask them when they are appropriate. I want to welcome the members to the uh, panel as well and uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair, thanks to the gentleman. Uh, the chairman of the full uh, committee is recognized for purposes of opening statements for five minutes. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Last year, as chairman of the House Oversight Committee, I held several hearings examining the causes of the financial crisis. Those hearings revealed a government regulatory structure that was unwilling and unable to meet the complexities of the modern economy. We found regulatory agencies that had fully abdicated their authority over banks and had done little or nothing to curb abusive practices like predatory lending. The prevailing attitude was that the market always knew best. Federal regulators became enablers rather than enforcers. The Obama administration has developed an ambitious plan to address these failures and to strengthen accountability and oversight in the financial sector. Today's hearing will take a close look at one piece of that plan, the proposal to create a single agency responsible for protecting consumers of financial products. A new approach is clearly warranted. The banking agencies have shown themselves to be unwilling to put the interests of consumers ahead of the profit interests of the banks they regulate. 
and the structure and division of responsibilities among these agencies has led to a regulatory race to the bottom. The Federal Trade Commission has taken steps to protect consumers, but its jurisdiction is limited and it has been hampered by a slow and burdensome rulemaking process. I am pleased that this subcommittee is holding today's hearing and examining the administration's proposal carefully. There are two areas in which attention and focus from this committee are particularly needed. First, the new agency must be structured to avoid the failures of the past. It only makes sense to create a new agency if that new agency will become a strong, authoritative voice for consumers. And second, we must ensure that the Federal Trade Commission is strengthened, not weakened, by any changes. Unlike the banking agencies, FTC has consumer protection as its core mission. In recent months, FTC has taken great strides to protect consumers of financial products, bringing enforcement actions against fraudulent debt settlement companies and writing new rules governing mortgages. The administration's proposal would give most of the FTC's authority over financial practices and some of FTC's authority over privacy to the new agency. At the same time, the administration proposes improving FTC's rulemaking authority and enforcement capabilities. It's not clear what impact these proposals would have on FTC or its ability to perform its consumer protection mission. As we build a new structure for protecting consumers of financial products, it's our responsibility to ensure that we do not weaken the agency currently responsible for consumer protections in this and many other areas. Once again, I thank Chairman Rush for holding this hearing. I welcome our witnesses to the committee. Look forward to their testimony. <coughs> The chair uh, thanks uh, the chairman of the full committee. And now the chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very important hearing. Uh, it's important for us as members of this subcommittee, and Mr. Chairman, in terms of our jurisdiction and what the implications are for jurisdiction in the future. Uh, the administration's newly proposed uh, CFPA, or the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, um, is relevant. It's an idea that a lot of us uh, uh, have mixed reactions on, uh, has uh, implications for our subcommittee. Although this is only one component of the administration's broad-reaching financial regulatory reform proposal, it certainly is an important part of that uh, overall uh, program and it needs uh, detailed examination. We must carefully consider the long-term effects uh, that this will have on the Federal Trade Commission, the consumers it is charged with protecting and on industry. Uh, currently, the Federal Trade Commission has broad authority to protect consumers from unfair and deceptive practices in the credit and debit, debit debt areas, and the FTC has notably been an effective and reliable agency in terms of consumer protection. We've seen it on this subcommittee. However, this new agency, the CFPA proposal, strips the Federal Trade Commission of virtually all of its consumer protection authorities pertaining to financial practices and even some of its privacy protection authority. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that's got to be concerned. The proposal compensates for this shifting of authority by granting the Federal Trade Commission streamlined, administrator, Procedures Act, APA, rulemaking authority, and the ability to seek civil penalties against unfair and deceptive practices. But this is a term which there's no clear definition, as well as making it unlawful to, quote, aid and abet, quote, in deceptive acts. So due to the shifting of power and the potential economic consequences of business, businesses, we must ensure that effective stakeholders have a voice at the table. But ultimately, we need to be assured that the CFPA, the new agency, will be an agency designed to do what is in the best interest of the consumers and not what is in the best interest of the bureaucrats who run it. Uh, one other uh, concern I would have, Mr. Chairman, uh, with the APA is um, it has 180 days for consideration. Uh, is this sufficient time? Under the Mag Moss Act, uh, rulemaking requirements included a public hearing 
And so, Mr. Chairman, may, perhaps as this bill moves along, uh, we might want to include uh, some kind of uh, public hearing uh, as a, incorporate as well as this 180 days of consideration. And with that, I yield back to my balance of my time. The chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Michigan, uh, the uh, chairman emeritus of the full committee, my friend, Mr. John Dingle, for five minutes for opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I commend you for this hearing. It is a very important one. It follows on a series of events which began with a raid on this committee by other committees and by the banking industry and by repeal of Glass-Steagall, which removed all the penalties and prohibitions against many of the illegal activities which brought us to the current lowest state in which we find ourselves financially and economically. At the Treasury Department, there was an office still, still in being called the Controller of the Currency who pushed to totally deregulate the banks and to unlearn the lessons which we learned during the Depression and to permit the abuses which the PCORA Commission found to be a problem. Things which brought about the 1929 crash. And lo and behold, the failure to learn those lessons or to preserve the protections which the Congress and the President in the 1930s put into place led to the economic collapse which occurred in the United States in the last calendar year and this calendar year. So the questions that we are watching are very close. The questions that we will be concerned with are, is going to be, are consumers protected? Is the Federal Trade Commission able to continue doing the work that it does to protect consumers? And this committee is going to concern ourselves this morning with these issues and means by which to ensure improved consumer protections continue to exist with regard to financial products and services. And to see to it that the Federal Trade Commission is able to carry out the responsibilities, which in a rather contemptible fashion were disregarded by the SEC and also by the controller of the currency. Now, we need to know if our concerns here and the pause which it gives, gives us um, occurs in part because of a transfer of existing authority from the Federal Trade Commission to a newly minted Consumer Financial Protection Agency, an agency whose behavior we don't know but an agency which is going to probably be composed of many of the good-hearted people who have brought us to this curious and unfortunate state of events. I will be truthful. I have significant concerns about these plans, and I will be intending to engage today's witnesses in a frank discussion about their merits. The administration, which has no fault, in the events of the deregulation and the collapse of the American economy in last year, envisions consolidating all consumer protection functions related to financial products, including rulemaking, supervision, examination, and enforcement under the aegis of the new CFPA, which would receive sole rulemaking enforcement authority over consumer financial protection statutes such as the Truth in Lending Act. At first glass, glance, this strikes me as a de jure and possibly unwarranted reassignment of FTC's consumer protection authorities in the financial services area. I will be looking to see whether this is so and whether in fact it is a good thing or can be justified by the administration. While a comparatively small agency, it is to be observed that FTC has done superb work in protecting consumers 
And in this, the country would benefit not from a diminished mandate to that agency, but rather to additional statutory authority, personnel, and funding. Consequently, I have more than a modest degree of skepticism regarding the administration's proposal. In brief, I wish for our witnesses to elucidate upon several matters associated with the CFPA proposal. First, if CFPA were mandated under law, what authorities would be left to FCC, or rather to FTC, and why would that occur? Second, what latitude would FTC have in enforcing consumer protection statutes as they relate to financial services? And what consumer protection statutes would be denigrated or dissipated under this proposal? Third, how would one characterize the level of interagency cooperation in the drafting of the administration's proposal? Finally, if CPA receives its proposed mandate, what will become of this committee's jurisdiction over consumer protection as designated under Rule 10 of the House of Representatives? I will welcome the witnesses' responses to these and other questions in order to proper establish an adequate record for additional action by the Congress, if such is deemed necessary. I would ask at this time that I have unanimous consent to keep the record open, to submit a list of questions to the witnesses today, and to have those responses and the questions inserted into the record. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy and foresight in this hearing. I would conclude by a personal note in welcoming Dr. Stephen Calkins, Associate Vice President for Academic Personnel and Professor of Law at Wayne State University in my home state of Michigan. His testimony has been invaluable to my understanding of this matter, and I look forward to his participation in the continuing debate on consumer financial protection. And I note, Mr. Chairman, that uh, my wife is a member of the Board of Governors of that great institution, which gives me a particularly warm feeling about it. Uh, and again, Mr. Chairman, I urge you and my colleagues to be most diligent, most cautious, most careful, and most dutifully suspicious of the events that we inquire into today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, thanks to the uh, Chairman Emeritus. Uh, the Chair wants to, um, uh, w w want to put before the committee the, U the UC request, and hearing no objections, uh, so ordered uh, the UC request by the Chairman Emeritus. And the Chair also wants to take a moment of personal privilege to uh, just uh, not to celebrate uh, the Chairman Emeritus's uh, uh, birthday and to wish him a happy birthday. So we want you uh, uh, to know that we all wish you a very happy birthday and many, many more. He three, a fellow is a little more careful about celebrating his birthdays. <laughs> the good news, the good news is I'm celebrating my 83rd birthday. The bad news is that I'm 83. Uh, <laughs> I, thank you, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy, and I thank my friends for their kindness and their courtesy. Thank you. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, for two minutes for opening statements. Why? Oh, excuse me. I didn't see Mr. Martin there. He just walked in. He just walked he just in. Did. Okay. Uh, he usually walks with a much bigger step. Mr. Martin is recognized. The, uh, well, you can go to Mr. Program. Whitfield. He was here before me. I'm, I'm fine with going to Ed, and then I'll then come back to me after the next uh, Y'all work that out then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Whitfield. <laughs> We're all very polite today, so thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you also for holding yet an, another important hearing examining the ongoing financial crisis and ways we can help our constituents get through these difficult times and mitigate future problems. Secretary Geithner said that this new Consumer Financial Protection Agency would have only one mission, and that is to protect consumers. 
it's also my understanding that this uh, proposal would eliminate the consumer protections at the FDIC, uh, the Federal Reserve Board, the controller of the currency. And uh, the impact on the FTC, if, perhaps we should explore expanding the authority of the FTC. Another problem that concerns me about the proposed legislation is that there is no federal preemption of any state law that is more stringent than the federal law. And anyone that's gone through a mortgage process and when they hand you the 45 pages of documents, you're going to find yourself getting more documents if you have these conflicting state laws on these consumer issues. And I think that's a real concern as well. But the problem that I have most of all is how much will this cost? Every day we pick up another article in a newspaper, growing national debt, maybe next economic crisis. Unless we demonstrate a strong commitment to physical sustainability in the longer term, we will have neither financial stability nor healthy economic growth. Interest payments on the debt alone last year was $452 billion. This, this year it's expected to be $470 billion, the largest federal spending category after Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and Defense. Another article today, economist declares train wreck because of out of control federal budget deficits. The economist talks about the real question is how much damage will greater indebtedness do to economic growth and government's credit worthiness. Those things may transcend what limited additional protection consumers get from this legislation. So I think we need to move cautiously find out how much cost are we talking about here and what will the benefits be. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the vice chair of the subcommittee, uh, my uh, friend from Illinois, Congressman Schakowsky, for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just came from a roundtable on women's financial literacy. Clearly, uh, an important issue. But what we have found is how daunting the environment has been for anyone who even is pretty literate in, uh, in financial issues. We, we've seen the systematic production and marketing and sales of countless of fi financial products, including mortgages that were extremely risky, even downright dangerous for borrowers, and often it was pretty hard to figure out what was what. Was what. For years, bank and non-bank lenders operated with too little oversight by government regulators, and when regulation was taking place, there was little focus on whether the financial products and services sold were safe for consumers. The Federal Trade Commission uh, and I, I'm so glad its chairman is here today, is essentially the only agency with a mandate to prioritize consumer safety and protect Americans from unfair or deceptive practices. And I commend Chairman Leibowitz for his renewed commitment to consumers' rights in the areas of credit and, and debt. However, as has been mentioned, the FTC's jurisdiction is limited to non-bank activities. The agency has been hampered for decades by cumbersome rulemaking authority, and in recent years its actions were limited by the previous administration's general contempt for oversight of the private sector. Overall, current regulations aren't sufficient, and they aren't working. Uh, we can't maintain a system which neglects consumer protection for the bulk of the financial service industry. Americans deserve access to honest information that will help them make educated decisions on mortgages, credit cards, and bank accounts. Dangerous financial products should be kept off the markets, and advertisers must be held accountable for their claims. We have to move forward with these goals, and I look forward to hearing today's testimony on how a consumer financial protection agency might achieve them. Thank you, and I yield back. The, the chair thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of, for the full committee, uh, the humble and honorable Mr. Barton uh, from Texas. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, five chair. minutes. Thank you. Before I give my opening statement, let me amplify what you said about our uh, the Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Dingell. Some people get one year of experience and that's it. They, 
his case, you could say that would be one year 83 times. But in Mr. Dingell's case, each year he adds it to the base where it compounds and amplifies by orders of magnitude. I think you can honestly say that uh, our friend and Chairman Emeritus is, is the most influential member of Congress uh, in our lifetime, and it is such a privilege to have him on our committee. And it is really fun when he is on my side. It is, it is, it is not so much fun when he is not on my side, but even then I learn from him. So uh, heartiest congratulations from the minority side to uh, a true gentleman of the House, uh, the, uh, uh, the conveyor and the uh, protector of institutional viability for this body. We wish you many, many more. With regards to this hearing, Mr. Chairman, I would bring the uh, members' attention to today's Wall Street editorial op-ed uh, piece about the particular agency. It's entitled, Let's Treat Borrowers Like Adults. It calls into question whether there needs to be a super consumer financial products protection agency, which the legislation we're looking at today would, uh, would empower. Uh, we accept the intentions being honorable, but uh, people like myself have extremely strong reservations about the implementation of such an agency. What would the legislation actually accomplish that some federal agency isn't already attempting to do? Uh, we'd like to know what's gone so wrong with our existing protection agencies that we deem it necessary to create another brand new agency. I'm a bit taken back by the breadth of the proposed coverage. This legislation, of course, relates a great deal to banking and other financial institutions over which this committee, unfortunately, has no jurisdiction, at least not now. One never knows about the future. But it reaches beyond that. It could reach accountants, auditors, gift cards, all other, all other types of institutions and uh, entrepreneurial activities. It doesn't fall strictly within our jurisdiction because it applies to banks, but it's still of concern. There seems to me to be an exception that swallows the preemption rule. According to the proposal, if I understand it correctly, state consumer laws of general application and those st state laws enacted pursuant to federal law intend intended to, and I quote, exceed or supplement federal law will now apply to any national bank. The Harvard professor is credited with inspiring this all-inclusive Consumer Financial Protection Agency described the need for it in her article, Unsafe at Any Rate. Professor Warren wrote that we need this agency in order to reverse industry practices that make it difficult for consumers to understand what they are getting in a financial product world. For example, 30 pages of contract terms for a simple credit card or 50 lines of convoluted and excessive text to explain all required disclosures. I understand that. I just co-signed for my stepdaughter's new condo in Austin, Texas, and it took an hour of signing various documents, some of which were documents I signed certifying that I just signed the previous document. So I understand the need for simplicity and the need for uh, perhaps a review of some of the existing uh, documents that we're asked to sign, but I'm not sure that uh, this agency gets there. This bill would assume that businesses and their customers are eager to pay more for such protection, maybe even a lot more, because there are no limits on the burdens to either. There are all kinds of reports this new agency could mandate, regular and special requests, but there are no limits to how often the agency could require those reports. And there's no mandate to consider the burden placed on the businesses to produce these reports. The preemption provisions really convey no preemption at all. In one paragraph, the proposal mandates all state laws are preempted, but only to the extent that they conflict. In the next, the legislation permits a state law to supersede federal law if the new agency determines the state law is more protective. That seems to be almost in direct opposition to the prior paragraph. What if a company is compliant with the federal law, but while the agency hasn't yet determined whether a state law is more protective, the Attorney General believes it is and brings action against the business for a violation. Is that company liable for its violations of state law without any notice? This would seem to exacerbate the decisions. 
but rather by making certain that the products themselves don't become the source of the trouble. I see my time is about to expire, Mr. Chairman. I have another page and a half of written commentary that simply put me down as, as extremely doubtful about the positive impact of this legislation. I think we would be better served on this committee and your subcommittee to go in and reform existing authority, clarify the differences between existing regulatory agencies, and if there is something that has really fallen through the crack, try to figure out one of the existing agencies like the FTC and see if we couldn't give them uh, explicit authority in that area that needs, uh, needs reinforcing. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for two minutes for opening statements. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this timely hearing to examine the administration's proposal to create a new agency that would consolidate and be responsible for consumer protection with regard to financial products and services. After the events of last year, there should be no doubt that Congress needs to act to further protect consumers with regard to financial regulation. This subcommittee has already taken steps to address this by moving forward legislation, H.R. 2309, the Consumer Credit and Debt Protection Act, to give the Federal Trade Commission additional powers to better address consumer credit, issue, credit and debt issues. It was widely agreed in the hearings that the legislation that will with the added authority H.R. 2309 would provide the FTC, it should take a broader and more effective role in consumer financial protection. With regard to the new tools, this proposal would give the FTC, the administration um, has addressed many of the problems that have hamstrung the Commission from taking steps to implement additional financial consumer protection, particularly with regard to the FTC rulemaking process. Magnus and Moss procedures are lengthy and cumbersome and can prevent the FTC from taking action on widespread problems in a timely and efficient manner. So I strongly support the provision of the administrative proposal that grant the Commission authority to conduct rulemaking authority under the Administrative Procedures Act. The proposal also follows 2309, granting the FTC authority to seek civil penalties for any violations of Section 5 of the FTC Act, which would provide a great uh, deterrent uh, to would-be actors. The portions of, that I propose I'm less certain about, however, would move nearly all the FTC's consumer protection authority for financial practices to the newly created Consumer Financial Protection Agency. I do not disagree that additional law enforcement is a good thing for the consumers. My main concern is we're adding a new enforcement regime that is siphoning off authority from our nation's primary consumer protection agency when that agency is more than capable of doing the job given the necessary tools and funding. Many of consumer protection functions the new agency would be responsible for would be moved from other agencies and departments that do not have consumer protection as their primary function. However, this is not the case of the FTC. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and why the administration believes the FTC should not continue these roles. And again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the timeliness of the hearing. I look forward to exploring with regard to this bill and look forward to the best path for, to protect consumers. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. Mr. Pitts is recognized uh, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing on the administration's proposal to create a new agency responsible for consumer protection. I think we all agree that we need strong consumer protection measures. The recent housing and credit crisis our country has faced makes this abundantly clear. We must do this prudently, though, avoiding the mistakes of the past. It seems, however, the proposal we have before us creates yet another divided system of regulation, making rooms for gaps in oversight. We saw the effects of divided regulation at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where two regulators meant less regulation, not more. The proposed new agency would also have the authority to set prices, rather than allowing costs to be determined by consumers in the marketplace. Everything from ATM fees, check overdraft fees, and late payment fees for credit cards would fall under the purview of this new agency. Instead of adding layers of bureaucracy to financial regulation and intervening in the marketplace, things we've tried in the past, we should work to bring transparency and consumer choice to our markets. Consumer financial protection is a worthy goal. Unfortunately, increasing the layers of bureaucracy in the financial industry has not protected consumers in the past, and I see no reason why it will this time around. 
Again, we all desire effective and efficient enforcement of consumer protection laws. It is my hope that this committee moves forward in a wise and careful manner with increased transparency and consumer choice as their primary goals. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for the two minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Wave opening. The Chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman, from, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling today's hearing. I applaud your leadership in addressing this important issue. I'd also like to thank the witnesses for joining us today. In today's economic recession, many families in my home district of Sacramento are struggling to make ends meet. I've heard countless stories of people struggling to keep their homes, their jobs, and their way of life. California, and in particular my constituents in Sacramento, have been greatly impacted by the economic crisis. Many of my constituents were and continue to be victims of predatory home loan lending, unfair credit card practices, payday loans, and other forms of unscrupulous business practices. Just recently, the President signed into law credit card reform legislation to regulate unfair credit card practices. The ink is hardly dry, but companies are already trying to find ways to arbitrarily raise credit card interest rates and fees on consumers. Struggling homeowners are also seeking assistance to keep their homes, but continue to be tricked into contacting scam artists who just so happen to be the same crowd that initially steered homeowners into subprime loans. This is all occurring as job losses mount, foreclosures continue to rise, and Americans are increasingly turning to other forms of credit to make ends meet. It is clear that consumers are not being properly protected from unfair and deceptive financial practices. When is enough enough? The President's proposal to create a new financial consumer protection, protection agency could be the answer the American consumers are seeking, but it must be done in a thoughtful way to ensure consumers are protected from fraudulent activity. We must make sure any new agency has real authority and just as much bite as it has bark. Consumers need to feel protected and have confidence in our financial system. Right now, it's clear that they do, they do not. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today, and I look forward to working with you in the committee on this issue moving forward. I yield back the balance of my time. <coughs> The chair thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be quick. I think the fundamental premise of this uh, proposed uh, or this bill is that the FTC, the entity in charge of protecting consumers, has evidently been an abysmal failure. Uh, I don't agree with that premise. Uh, I think the issue should be uh, how do we make sure that the FTC is uh, properly empowered to protect consumers, uh, and uh, that should be what we are working for as opposed to uh, uh, stripping away whatever jurisdiction they have over uh, protecting consumers and creating some uh, uh, monolithic uh, new government agency in, in replace of what already exists. Uh, so I. I'm very uh, skeptical of this uh, process or this, uh, this bill, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses so we can determine if uh, uh, FTC is capable of doing what they uh, uh, have been doing and whether or not this bill is even necessary. So I yield back. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan uh, Ms. Sutter, for two minutes. Sutton. Thank you, Chairman Rush, and thank you for holding today's very important hearing on the newly proposed Consumer Financial Protection Agency. As Elizabeth Warren aptly stated in describing the need for an agency like this, quote, it is impossible to buy a toaster that has a one in five chance of bursting into flames and burning down your house but it is possible to refinance an existing home with a mortgage that has the same one in five chance of putting a family out on the street, and the mortgage won't even carry a disclosure of that fact to the homeowner." End quote. Unfortunately, many people in my district who were preyed upon by so many unscrupulous companies, people know this all too well. The well-known and tragic case of one of my constituents, Addie Polk, 
is a shocking example of a financial product that not only caused someone to almost be homeless, but caused someone to attempt to take their own life. At the age of 86, Ms. Polk was given a new 30-year mortgage on a house she already owned, and for an amount greater than the value of her house. Let me say that again. At the age of 86, Ms. Polk was given a new 30-year mortgage on a house she already owned and for an amount greater than the value of her house. Less than four years later, Ms. Polk, probably of no surprise to the person who sold the mortgage to her, began to have trouble making her payments and her house fell into foreclosure. Feeling trapped and without options, Ms. Polk shot herself rather than lose the house she lived in for 40 years. No one ever should be in Ms. Polk's position. Now is our chance, in honor of Ms. Polk and countless other Americans who have found themselves the unfortunate owners of financial products with indecipherable terms, smoke and mirror-like provisions, and gotcha fees to truly support strong consumer protection. I look forward to hearing from the panel about how we make sure we provide the needed protection. And I yield back. The chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey, for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I, I thank you for calling the hearing and the welcome back, uh, uh, John Leibowitz and uh, uh, Honorable uh, Barr, the Assistant Secretary of Financial Institutions. Uh, I, I associate my remarks really with what uh, the gentleman from Nebraska on our side just said. Uh, uh, Mr. Terry, here we are creating a, a whole new uh, federal government bureaucracy uh, when we have uh, one already that's doing a heck of a job, as as it uh, certainly seems to me, and I think most members on this uh, on this panel. Uh, so the, the question becomes, uh, you know, why? Why, uh, to use a medical expression, throw the baby out with the bathwater? Uh, if we're doing, if the FTC is doing the, 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 the right and proper job and the right and proper oversight and all of a sudden we come in and spend more federal dollars, as the gentleman from Kentucky was talking about earlier, about creating a whole new federal bureaucracy. So uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, happy to hear from the witnesses and uh, maybe they can explain that. Hopefully they will explain that. But I think this is something that we need to look at very, very carefully as we just continue to create uh, one more or to consider creating one more government bureaucracy at a time when uh, when we're running billions of dollars of deficit year after year after year. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll yield back. The chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, for calling this critically important hearing on the Obama administration's proposal for a consumer financial protection agency. Uh, last Congress, in the wake of widespread concerns about toxic lead on, in paint on children's toys and other toxic consumer products, this subcommittee originated legislation to reorganize and strengthen the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And last year, as the economy plunged, there were some analogous terms being used to describe some of the mortgage and investment products. Uh, we heard about toxic assets, poisoning banks, balance sheets, and toxic mortgage products, leaving millions of our neighbors facing foreclosure. Um, predatory lenders wreaked havoc on my community, and the subsequent uh, significant decline in property values has affected millions of folks in my home state. And unfortunately, consumers could not count on state oversight of uh, these mortgage brokers in, in my home state. They just turned a blind eye, and I recommend the Miami Herald expose that documented how many convicted felons entered into this subprime uh, mortgage uh, loan marketing business. So this financial crisis has taught us that in order to maintain a healthy economy, effective regulation must focus on protecting consumers from abusive, deceptive, and unfair lending practices. Uh, the FTC has the enforcement authority to go after only non-depository lending institutions that deal unfairly with their borrowers, but the abuses that led to the financial crisis spread deep into the banking system. 
So in light of the need for more effective regulation of all lending institutions, depository and non-depository, the Obama administration has rightly proposed a reorganization. And I think all of us can agree that regulation of financial institutions must be improved to better protect consumers. However, we must be aware not only of the impact of granting authority to a new consumer financial protection agency, but also of the consequences to consumers of the changes that have been proposed to the, the FTC. The administration's proposal would reshape the FTC by shifting authority over consumer credit, but also by streamlining its rulemaking process and allowing it to assess civil penalties on bad actors. I, so I look forward to your testimony uh, on what this new FTC might look like and how its ability to achieve its mandate of consumer protection will be affected. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for having this hearing. Uh, the administration is proposing yet another new federal agency with vague sweeping authority. We all know there have been bad actors in our financial system that took advantage of consumers and contributed to the current economic crisis. Unfortunately, many of the problems that brought on today's financial crisis are not even being addressed in this bill. The proposed legislation does not address the real bad actors in our financial systems. F Freddie May, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and other institutions that engaged in subprime lending and relaxing their standards to encourage more people to take out loans they could not afford. Those warning signs were brought before Congress for years, and yet many of the same people in this administration and in the leadership in this Congress are the same people who oppose the very reforms that would have prevented this financial crisis from happening in the first place. This proposed new agency represents yet another step in the federal government trying to run all aspects of our lives. The government is running banks and car companies with disastrous results. The so-called stimulus bill, which spends $787 billion of money we don't have, is now being recognized even by this administration as a failure that didn't create any jobs that were promised. There are even some in this administration floating the reckless idea of yet another massive spending bill since the last one uh, didn't work. Scores of experts predict that this administration's cap-and-trade energy tax will cost us millions of jobs while increasing electricity rates on all American families. We're debating a bill that proposes a government takeover of health care, which has been tried and failed in other countries, to the point that sick people with the means in those countries come here to get their health care because government-run health care leads to rationing everywhere it's been tried. Now we have this bill to create a consumer czar. Enough is enough. Let's fix the problems that exist and make reforms to federal agencies that are causing these problems, rather than adding yet another layer of government bureaucracy that simply covers up the root causes of the problem while punishing those who played by the rules. I look forward to hearing the comments from today's panel and would like to hear how the administration's plan inf impacts the FTC. In his testimony, Chairman Leibowitz speaks to the successes the FTC has had in protecting consumers in financial matters, which begs the question why we need a new agency with all these sweeping new powers and spends more money that we don't have. I yield back. <clears throat> the Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from uh, Colorado, Mr. Getz, for uh, The Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, for two minutes. With that, the chair thanks the gentleman. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, for holding this very important hearing, and I especially want to thank the witnesses for their testimony today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope this hearing will provide an opportunity for the subcommittee to address some concerns that we have about the proposed agency, particularly the loss of jurisdiction on the part of the Federal Trade Commission. Now, my colleagues are, are right, Mr. Chairman. There are many actors to blame for the current state of our economy, uh, unscrupulous subprime mortgage lenders and speculators and the lack of effective oversight have all contributed to the financial meltdown. Of deep concern, and rightfully so, is the regulatory patchwork of federal agencies charged with regulating all aspects of financial institutions. Uh, for example, depository institutions such as banks and credit unions are overseen by many different agencies. Conversely, all non-depository institutions are overseen by one agency, and that is the FTC. 
Uh, the FTC has done a good job, and I think we can all agree on that, at regulating these players, and I am concerned that reducing FTC oversight as part of the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency may do more harm than good. While I am pleased that the Administration's proposal seeks to strengthen the FTC's rulemaking and enforcement abilities in areas unrelated to financial products, I believe that it is extremely important that the FTC maintain strong non-depository institution oversight. Uh, the Administration's proposed agency would seek to achieve four important objectives aimed at bolstering consumer confidence in financial institutions and transactions. Uh, these objectives include ensuring con consumer education and understanding of these financial products, uh, better protection uh, consumers better protecting consumers from unfair and deceptive practices and discrimination, ensuring consumer financial services uh, operate fairly, making certain that underserved communities like my district uh, have uh, increased access to financial services. These are excellent objectives, and I strongly support the goals of the proposed agencies, but I want to be certain that the creation of a new regulatory agency will not place undue and unnecessary strains and burdens on existing Federal regulatory frameworks that may still be capable of meeting those same goals and objectives. And so, Mr. Chairman, this hearing today is vitally important. I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses, and I thank you for the time. The Chair thanks the gentleman. Uh, the Chair sees no other members who have opening statements. Now it is uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce panel one uh, of uh, uh, this is a two-panel <coughs> hearing, and panel one consists of the Honorable Michael Barr, who is the Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions at the Department of Pleasure. We want to welcome uh, Mr. Barr back uh, to this uh, committee once again. And also joining him at the witness table is someone who is very familiar to this subcommittee, the Honorable John Libowitz who is the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, Chairman Libowitz, we certainly welcome you back uh, again uh, to this uh, subcommittee. It is the practice of this uh, subcommittee now to swear in uh, the witnesses. So I would like for you, each of you to stand uh, and raise your right hand. <clears throat> yeah. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have asked in the affirmative. Now, uh, we want to recognize, beginning with Mr. Barr, uh, the witnesses for an opening statement. You have five minutes or thereabouts uh, for your opening statement. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mr. Barr, you're recognized for five Thank minutes you. or thereabouts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Ricky, uh, Ranking Member Rodonovich, for providing me with this opportunity to testify about President Obama's proposal uh, to establish a new, strong financial regulatory agency charged with just one job, looking out for consumers across the financial services landscape. As Secretary Geithner has said, protecting consumers is important in its own right and also central to safeguarding our financial system as a whole. We must restore honesty and integrity to our financial system. That is why President Obama personally feels so strongly about creating this new Consumer Financial Protection Agency. I understand the Committee's concerns that have been expressed today with respect to uh, boundary issues, jurisdictional issues, and the role of the FTC. I think as we work together on those issues, it's important to keep in mind the central goal we all share, having one agency for one marketplace with one mission, protecting consumers. The new agency will have the authority and the resources it needs to set consistently high standards for banks and non-bank financial providers alike. To put an end to regulatory arbitrage, to put an end to unregulated corners of our financial system, then inevitably weaken standards across the board. This agency will be accountable for its mission, yet independent. It will have a wide range of tools to promote transparency, simplicity, and fairness. It will act in a balanced manner, considering costs as well as benefits, in a way that protects consumers from abuse while ensuring their access to innovative, responsible financial services. It will be able to reduce regulatory burden 
while helping consumers. For example, by creating one simple mortgage disclosure form uh, for all consumers to use. It will not set prices for any service. The federal government has failed to date in its most basic regulatory responsibility, utterly failed to protect consumers. The deep financial crisis that we are still in, let me emphasize that we are still in today, revealed the alarming failure of our existing regime to protect responsible consumers and to keep the playing field level for responsible providers. Instead of leadership and accountability, we have had a fragmented system of regulation designed for failure. Bank and non-bank financial service providers compete vigorously in the same consumer markets, but are subject to two different and uncoordinated federal regimes, one based on examination and supervision, the other on after-the-fact investigation and enforcement. Less responsible actors are willing to gamble that the FTC and the states lack the resources to detect and investigate them. This puts enormous pressure, too, on banks, thrifts, and credit unions to lower their standards to compete and on their regulators to let them. And no financial provider should be forced to choose between keeping market share and treating consumers fairly. This is precisely what happened in the mortgage market. Independent mortgage companies peddled risky mortgages in misleading ways to borrowers who could not handle them. To compete, banks and thrifts and their affiliates relaxed their standards on underwriting and sales, and their regulators were slow to act. The consequences for homeowners were devastating, and our economy is still paying the price. Fragmented regulation facilitated abusive credit cards. Tricks and traps enabled banks to advertise selectively low annual percentage rates to grab market share and boost income. Other banks could not compete if they offered fair credit cards with transparent pricing, and consumers ended up with retroactive rate hikes and unfair terms. The list goes on uh, and on. Credit unions and community banks with straightforward credit products struggled to compete with less scrupulous providers who appeared to offer a good deal and then pulled a switch on the consumer. Our federal agencies do not currently have the mission, structures, and authorities suited to effective consumer protection in consumer financial markets. The FTC has no jurisdiction over banks, and it does not have the supervisory and examination authority to detect and prevent problems before they spread throughout the market. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see that I will be significantly over my time. Could I uh, take several additional minutes? Uh, yes, uh, you so approved. Thank you. You're on your thereabouts part of your testimony. Thank you. Uh, bank regulators have supervisory powers over banks, but their primary mission is to ensure that banks are safe and sound and not to protect consumers. Consumer protection supervision is never going to share the front seat with safety and soundness. Tinkering with the consumer protection mandates or authorities of our existing agencies cannot solve these structural problems. We need a structural solution. We need one agency for one marketplace with one mission to protect consumers of financial products and services and the authority to achieve that mission. That's the agency we are proposing to create. The CFPA will have the sole mission of protecting consumers. It will write rules, supervise institutions, examine them, uh, and lead enforcement efforts for the whole marketplace. The implications for our proposal for consumer protection and competition are enormous. The proposal will bring higher and more consistent standards, stronger, faster responses to problems, the end of regulatory arbitrage, a level playing field for all providers, and more efficient regulation. Our proposal gives the agency the power to strengthen mortgage regulation across all lenders and brokers. It can strengthen disclosure, make it easier for consumers to choose simple products, prevent lenders from paying yield spread premiums that pay brokers more if they deliver loans with higher rates than consumers qualify for. The agency would implement credit card protections and update these protections as markets change. And it would set high national standards for licensing, bonding, monitoring, of all non-bank financial services providers. Let me say, the FTC is a good agency. The chairman and I are good friends. Our legislation does not affect the jurisdiction of the FTC over the vast array of non-financial markets and actually strengthens its ability to police those markets. To increase the FTC's ability to protect consumers, 
we propose that the FTC be able to adopt rules to prohibit unfair or deceptive acts or practices with standard notice and comment rulemaking, to obtain civil penalties when companies act in an unfair or deceptive way, and to pursue those who substantially aid and abet providers that commit unfair or deceptive practices. The administration also supports increased resources for the FTC so that consumers can be better protected across all markets. As for financial markets, the FTC would continue to have authority under the FTC Act to pursue financial fraud without delay, including on foreclosure rescue and loan modification scams. The FTC will retain authority for writing rules under the Telemarketing Sales Act and concurrent responsibility for enforcing them over financial products and services. And the FTC would retain primary authority in the area of data security for non-bank entities. In addition, the FTC would have backstop authority to enforce the same consumer credit statutes that it can enforce today. Under that authority, the FTC, or frankly a bank regulator, could, if it becomes aware of a, a possible law violation, refer it to the new agency, and if the new agency doesn't act, take action itself. That same referral requirement will apply uh, to the bank regulators, and it is designed to ensure a consistent federal approach to an interpreting and enforcing our consumer protection statutes. Finally, let me just say this. It is time to put consumer protection responsibility in an agency with a focused mission and comprehensive jurisdiction over all financial services providers, banks and non-banks alike. It is time for a level playing field for all financial services providers. It is a time for an agency that consumers and their elected representatives can hold fully accountable and responsible for consumer protection in all financial sectors. And it is also long past time for a stronger FTC. The President's legislation fulfills these needs. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the proposal, the additional time you have graciously given me, uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions uh, at the conclusion of our opening statements. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a unanimous uh, consent that the gentleman from the FTC have nine minutes. I believe I'll be giving back it. And the, the, the chairman of the FTC would take uh, whatever time he may consume. You've been having a little problem with the microphone. Chairman Rush, uh, Ranking Member Radonovich, Vice Chair Schakowsky, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here to discuss consumer protection regular, regulatory reform, including President Obama's far-reaching proposal to enhance consumer protection through the creation of a new consumer financial protection agency, the CFPA. As all of us in this room know, and as many of you on the panel articulated and as Mr. Barr also effectively articulated, the need for reform has become as painfully clear as the distress that consumers are now experiencing in these difficult economic times uh, from the failure of regulation. All of us on the Commission, all of us on the Commission support the President's goal of elevating consumer protection, although some of us have different views as to the best means to that. Thank you so much. You see, we are good friends. Uh, uh, although some of us have different views as to the best means to that end. Uh, for my part, this initiative, which enhances resources and authority for the FTC and which creates the CFPA, is clearly preferable to the status quo. In any case, the Commission will continue to vigorously protect consumers of financial services while this proposal is under discussion. CFPA, if it's enacted, uh, is ramping up. Beyond that, we look forward to working collaboratively with the new agency. Thank you so much. Now I feel like I'm at a press conference. Um, in the last five years, uh, we've brought more than 100 financial consumer protection cases and have recovered nearly half a billion dollars in the last decade for consumers. Since I last testified before the subcommittee in late March, uh, We've continued aggressively pursuing financial predators, bringing 14 new cases in this area. In fact, uh, today we're announcing distribution of an additional $8 million in consumer redress checks uh, to Americans who were deceived uh, by uh, mortgage, uh, deceptive mortgage origination fees. And on June 1st, 
uh, using the new APA rulemaking authority that you gave us in the omnibus uh, appropriations bill, uh, we began our rulemaking addressing mortgage modification and foreclosure rescue scams, uh, which have become, as all of you know, all too common uh, recently, and also addressing the entire mortgage life cycle, advertising, origination, appraisals, and servicing. Simply put, uh, this work will help ensure that consumers aren't ripped off by bogus mortgages or false advertising. Mr. Chairman, President Obama emphasized the importance of giving the FTC tools and increased resources, the ones that we need uh, to stop practices that harm consumers and violate the law. Uh, first, the proposal grows our agency, giving us the staff that uh, we need to do the job that you all want us to do. Currently, we have just over 1,100 FTEs. Uh, that's down from about the 1,800 FTEs we had in the late 1970s and early 1980s, despite a considerable growth in uh, the U.S. population and in our own responsibilities, including enforcing can spam, do not call, COPPA, uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, gram leach Bliley facta and other statutes. Second, the proposal provides the FTC with APA notice and comment rulemaking, uh, which is used by virtually every other agency uh, in the federal government. It would strengthen the Commission's ability to address widespread problems more quickly. Third, uh, the proposal authorizes the FTC to obtain civil penalties for violations of Section 5 of the FTC Act. Uh, this new power, we believe, would help deter would-be violators and help consumers uh, uh, help protect consumers more effectively. I think something like 47 state attorneys general have fining authority. And by the way, fining authority was originally proposed uh, by Casper Weinberger uh, when he was chairman of the Federal Trade Commission under President Nixon in the early 1970s. Finally, the proposal authorizes the FTC to go after those who aid and abet others who violate the law. Uh, we'd also urge Congress, as you consider this legislation, uh, to give both the FTC and the CFPA uh, the ability to bring civil penalty actions on our own, uh, which would put both of us on equal footing with other consumer protection agencies like the uh, SEC and the CFTC and not make us, as we do, currently have to wait uh, for the Justice Department to clear uh, uh, our going forward. Um, now, we expect that, as with any bold and complex new initiative, clarifications will be worked out as the legislative process moves forward. But from my perspective, uh, the President's goal of streamlining the overall system for protecting consumers from financial abuse is more than commendable, and eliminating the balkanization uh, of consumer protection oversight over non-banks and banks, as Mr. Barr has alluded to, uh, is laudable and very, very critical. We do have some concerns, however. Uh, about the draft legislation or the legislation in its, uh, as it was initially drafted, um, although I'm optimistic uh, uh, that we can work these out as the legislative process moves forward. So, for example, uh, the proposal states uh, that the FTC would have backstop authority, uh, but the draft uh, uh, legislation imposes a review period that could require us to wait 120 days before filing uh, certain cases. We also believe it would be helpful to make definitions of the proposal's terms, such as credit and financial activity, uh, clearer. And let me tell you why with an example. So suppose the FTC finds a telemarketer uh, making illegal robocalls to millions of consumers on the Do Not Call Registry, urging them to purchase something like advance fee credit cards, which are, I wouldn't say per se illegal, but almost always, uh, but, but let's say often illegal. Um, and suppose that a payment processor participated in the fraud. Um, it is critical uh, that we be able to bring an action against all of the malefactors expeditiously. But it's unclear under this draft uh, whether we'd have the jurisdiction over the telemarketer offering the financial products or the payment processor, and if so, whether the 120-day waiting period would come into play. Um, now we've made much progress uh, with Treasury on several of these boundary issues, um, and we're continuing to make progress. Uh, but, getting, uh, but getting this right uh, and allowing us to put an immediate halt to harmful practices is, is, is crucially important. Um, having said that, uh, with this committee involved in writing any legislation, um, I am confident that uh, this very, very important initiative will be considered, discussed, clarified, and refined. Um, with all open issues resolved in favor of American consumers. Um, we understand, of course, that under this proposal, rulemaking authority and primary, and primary enforcement responsibility for financial uh, products and services would go to the new agency, uh, but we will continue to aggressively enforce these laws as a cop on the beat where necessary, um, as well as each and every other consumer protection law within our jurisdiction. 
Um, we look forward to working with the administration and Congress uh, to reach a plan that best protects American consumers. And I thank you for your time. And the chair, happy to answer questions. Yes, the chair thanks the gentleman, uh, the chairman of the uh, FTC, and he re the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes uh, for the purposes of questioning the witnesses. <clears throat> With the continuation of the financial crisis, we see more and more scam artists preying on desperate consumers seeking to reduce their debts and to keep their homes out of foreclosure or from selling their homes at a loss. And I'm concerned about uh, this proposal in that uh, this new agency will not do enough in the short term because all, we all know that it takes uh, some time for a new agency to, to rev up uh, and to get going and to get running. Um, uh, another option that the administration might have considered is uh, proposing that the FTC uh, take on this essential role and have, by increasing its staff and authority, it's conceivable that FTC could be taking on these issues within weeks or months rather than uh, years. Uh, Mr. Barr, did the administration consider other options uh, other than creating a new agency? Uh, yes, Mr. Rush, let me um just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, with respect to the transition issues, our view is that the FTC should act aggressively as it is doing now under the Chairman's leadership uh, to continue to uh, enforce the law, be a cop on the beat, be quite aggressive in this area. And we are, at the same time that we are pushing to create the new agency, uh, pushing on all the existing agencies, working closely with them to do everything we can under existing authority. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any sense that anybody thinks we should slow down, rather quite the opposite. Uh, with respect to other options, the, the administration considered a wide range of options with respect to uh, consumer protection. Uh, and our basic view was that the existing system was fundamentally broken uh, and we needed uh, a quite large significant change uh, to create one agency whose sole job was protecting consumers across the financial services marketplace. I, I think that the chairman is, is deeply aware of the ways in which consumers have been abused and neglected uh, for quite a long time, and the existing structure is just inadequate to, uh, to meet the need. So our strong view, the president's uh, personally strong view, uh, was that we needed a, a new financial agency with that core mission uh, that was strong uh, and could, um, uh, could achieve the goals that I think that uh, the chairman articulated so eloquently in the opening remarks. And, and chairman Livowitz, during this uh, interregnum between this bill becoming law and, and, and implementing and this new creation uh, actually taking place, uh, that, that's going to put a, a lot of more pressure on the uh, FTC. Uh, do you have the requisite resources and, and uh, personnel? Uh, how will the FTC function during this interregnum? Well, I would say that during the sort of interregnum period, if the legislation is enacted, um, we're going to work very closely with the new agency. I think the period for transfer is somewhere between 6 and 24 months, depending on how quickly they're ready to ramp up. We're going to continue to bring cases. Um, I, I, I do think it's, uh, and, 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 and I think that was always the notion. Um, I do think that, that going forward, you know, we could use more resources, and we've talked about this uh, before in, in hearings. Um, and, uh, and I do think that even after the agency is created, assuming it is, uh, that it would be useful for us to have uh, concurrent enforcement authority so that if we're going after, you know, the bad guys don't always act in silos, as, uh, as Mr. Barton knows and as all of you know. Um, you know, sometimes they're violating the do not call rule and they're violating 
uh, Reg Z or Reg E, which would go over to the um, uh, over to the uh, 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 new agency. And so I, I think it's important going forward uh, that um, when there's ongoing consumer harm, that we're able to sort of jump over the kind of legislative, uh, the, the new legislative fence to help consumers and not have to wait potentially 120 days. I think we're working through a lot of these issues uh, and making a lot of progress uh, between our staffs and ourselves. Uh, the chair sees that his time is up. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, gentlemen, to the panel. I'm pleased to see you here today. Um, Mr. Leibowitz, and welcome back to the committee. I know you've been here a number of times already and probably will be more in the future. I, I got to think you're doing a bit of a dance because um, you, you stand to lose uh, some jurisdiction in, in the FTC. And it seems to me that you're getting, or at least under the proposal, uh, getting more money and authority to do less. And I want to know what your reaction to that statement is, given the fact that the FTC has dual jurisdiction, and that is two missions, to um, ensure competition, but also consumer protection. Well, 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 Mr. Donovich, let me just start by saying I hope that familiarity is not breeding contempt here. Not at all. And, not um, at all. Um, look, you know, if you, if you read through our written testimony, you can sort of see it's a complex matrix within the Commission about what we support and what we don't. I, I, I do think from, from our perspective, if you create this, from my perspective, if you create this new agency and, um, and you also give us more resources and authority, um, c from the perspective of consumers, they will be getting a better deal because we'll be able, we'll continue to have a backstop authority with financial, with respect to financial matters. And we're going to be able to concentrate and, and just do more for consumers. As you know, and because we, we've talked about this, we spend a lot of time but, but leveraging But if I may, but you are losing jurisdiction. Well, we would be losing jurisdiction and we'd then, be losing Then FCE. how does that loss of jurisdiction deal with your two missions of ensuring competition and providing consumer protection? Well, I would say on the competition side, we wouldn't be losing jurisdiction. We'd still, we'd still retain that jurisdiction. Um, on the consumer protection side, we would be losing jurisdiction to this new agency, but this new agency would be another cop on the beat protecting consumers. And, 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 and then, um, uh, and we'd also be living, losing personnel. We have, uh, and, and we, we have already lost a few personnel, I would say, um, uh, to the but new it, agency. It does seem to me like you're getting more money and authority to do less. Well, we'll do more. I mean, we really will. Uh, it's not a question from our perspective of, 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 of moving to a government sinecure. I mean, our guys work extremely hard. Uh, they've been commended by OPM for always scoring high on sort of effectiveness and, and, and uh, 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 quality of work. Um, and we'll just do more in the areas where we have, while retaining backup authority, uh, if the proposal goes through, we'll do more in the other areas of consumer protection, and there's plenty to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barr, welcome to the subcommittee. I, you know, during, in Russia, during the height of communism, uh, it was often talked about the fact that there was not a lot of food on the shelves. And when you'd go into stores, you might be able to get a loaf of bread, but if you wanted sourdough, you probably had to have the standard loaf. If you wanted rolls, you got a loaf of bread. If you wanted something else, you got a loaf of bread. Tell me how, explain to me how you're not doing the same thing in the credit markets in the name of consumer protection. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, terrific um, a ter terrific question. I sort of I was smiling because as you were describing the example, I spent some time in, in Poland and had the same experience where you, you go to the store and there's there's nothing there and you can actually literally go hungry. Uh, this agency has nothing to do with that. Literally nothing to do with that. Tell me how so you're the, not the doing new that though in the credit markets. Then that's because that's so that the, would be the, the question new, I'd like answered. The new agency is in no way. Uh, pursuing that kind of command and control model. It's in no way pursuing uh, price setting. It's in no way saying you can't offer certain kinds of products. The new agency under the legislation. But, and I, I understand I the reason for looking at this because we've all, you know, experiencing this financial crisis. But doesn't this end up l providing consumers with less choice 
and driving up the cost of uh, credit for consumers? With respect, sir, our strong view is that it does not. It continues to provide for financial innovation. Consumers can get access to whatever products and services providers want to offer. Our basic approach is to improve disclosure, reduce regulatory burden, for example, by merging TILA and RESPA authorities. You can have one simple mortgage form at the time of disclosure. But, but improve Mr. weren't there existing authorities that, that have and could and should deal with the, the current crisis that we are in? Doesn't the added restrictions and regulations that you are going to be putting on the credit industry will drive up the cost of credit to consumers? I, I think that the, the, the better judgment, sir, again, with respect, is that the, the current system we have had, the status quo on consumer protection, was a, a dismal failure. And I think we have evidence all around us of that. And our view was, both for, for banks and for non-banks, for consumers and for households, the system failed. If you talk to, I am sure you do, the community bankers in your community who had to compete against unregulated providers who were sucked into Actually, offering they're products competing that against they don't large want. banks for TARP money. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, the Chair uh, now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, the Vice Chair, Ms. Shukowski. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barr, could you um, describe how we potentially would have been in a different situation today had this agency been in existence as the current problems started to unroll? Yes. Th I, I think we would have been in a, could have been in a fundamentally different situation if we had an agency that could set the rules of the road for everybody to follow, if we had an agency that could say to mortgage brokers, you can't get paid more for offering riskier, higher, pri higher priced, more confusing products than a basic product. If we had a rule that said, mortgage brokers, you have a duty of care, you have to do best execution for a mortgage, so you can't offer the mortgage that's the best deal for the broker, you're supposed to offer a mortgage that's the best deal for the consumer. If we had a duty that said, mortgage brokers have to have some skin in the game, they need to be paid over time, Securitization trusts have to have skin in the game so that you don't have a system where all the bad mortgages are made up front and eventually sold to the investor at the other end with nobody in the chain having responsibility, nobody having any of their own, uh, own um, uh, capital at risk. So we could have had fundamental change. We could have had a fundamentally different situation in which consumers were protected at the front end and the financial system was protected all the way through. And you are saying had without any change in uh, legislation beyond the creation of this agency that you would have the authorities then under the, under the bill, which I, I haven't read thoroughly yet, you would be able to have done all those things? Yes. This agency would be granted the authority to do all the things that I just described. Did you want to comment on that, Mr. Well, well, I just say that, that, that sort of one of the things that's critical here um, is APA rulemaking authority, and and of course under the new proposal, uh, they'll be able to do it for non-bank as well as bank-related financial instruments and mortgages. And so, in um, in in the omnibus you gave us, and for which we are very grateful, APA rulemaking uh, for uh, non-bank mortgages. Um, and we're going to look at that, and we're going to do, I think, a very, very good rule. Uh, and Mr. Rush, you have uh, legislation that would expand our jurisdiction a little bit more, but it only goes, it, but it's only within the context of, of, of uh, non-bank issued financial instruments. So, 20 years ago, we did a lot of uh, uh, matters relating to credit cards, um, and uh, all the credit cards are now, virtually every credit card is now issued by a bank. We have no jurisdiction there. So I think, I think that's, a, that's, that's, that's a critical advantage from the consumer's perspective of, 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 uh, of what this new agency might do. But let, and let me just say that, that while I absolutely in theory think pulling it all together in one place is a good idea, but you know, we, we've seen in the startup of the Department of Homeland Security lots of difficulties in making it, pulling it all together and making it all happen. The creation of a director of national intelligence. There, it, it, certainly in that case, many of us on the intelligence committee see a large bureaucracy itself de developing um, and, um, you know, have some problems with the 
coordination that was actually supposed to happen. Um, how can we be assured that this will achieve its goals, achieve it in a timely way, and not just be another bureaucracy? Uh, thank you very much. I, I, again, I think that our view is the agencies that have the authority now should aggressively um, use those authorities. Those authorities are inadequate to the task. The basic structure of the system was a dismal failure. We need to do this. We need to take this action. The legislation has tight timelines for transition. Treasury has responsibility to make sure that transition happens effectively. You can come see me. You can come see Secretary Geithner. We are responsible for making sure you can hold us accountable. The Chair recognizes uh, the Mr. Stearns I'm from Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have had a lot of uh, hearings on privacy here on this committee. And uh, when, when I was Chairman of the committee, we had uh, We had many hearings on privacy, and I think my concern is that if we transfer some of the Federal Trade Commission's privacy work to this new CFPA, uh, particularly in light of all the expertise that you have, and you've been the leading federal agency in the area of consumer privacy for all these years, um, and including financial privacy as well as identity theft, information security. So, with that in mind, uh, would what do you feel about this transfer? Well, I, I guess I'd make a couple points. And in, in this committee and you have been leaders on, on privacy-related issues. Um, you know, we'll be transferring over a lot of laws. We hope to keep sort of a backstop authority that is concurrent. Um, and, of, and of course, this is the beginning of the legislative process. It's not the no, end. I and, 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 and you know, I see a lot of agreement on, on many things within this committee on on on, on ways to go forward. Um, on on grant, I think. The way we read the legislation, it was unclear whether issues like data security, privacy would stay with us. I think Mr. Barr is representing today the better reading of the of the uh, of the of the proposed statute, or or the reading of the way the proposed statute will move forward, is that we'll keep issues like that, and I think that's very very important. So identity theft, you'd still keep? I, I think we would keep identity theft and yes. uh, financial privacy. Financial privacy, I think, mostly moves over to the new agency. I mean, again, I think that's to some extent up to you. I think we would keep the safeguards rule under Graham Leach Bliley. But a, a lot of this has to be worked through. Of course, during the transition period, we'll keep on doing this. And again, we'll have backstop authority. We won't be doing the, and I, and I should probably turn this over to Mr. Barr, who's the, uh, the, the, one of the true architects of the plan. Um, but so, so I, what you're saying today is that some of this is still up for negotiation. Well, yeah, th th these boundary issues um, uh, that you've raised the same concerns that we saw when we when we got the legislation at the end of last week, um, it, but it seems that it's being resolved uh, on on some of these on many of these boundary issues uh, in favor of retaining jurisdiction um, by the existing commission, and I, I assume that's what you know if this legislation moves forward, that's what this committee uh, would be most interested in. But let me turn it over, to Mr. Burke. Yeah, just just to uh, add to that, uh, the ch the chairman is is correct with respect to uh, data security issues. Issues, identity theft issues, safeguard, red flags, all that would stay at the FTC. Uh, and the parallel authority for that uh, at the bank agencies. But the front end privacy notices that uh, have to do with disclosure uh, would fit in the new disclosure regime of the new uh, Consumer Financial Protection Agency. So let's say Internet privacy, consumer privacy, would that be part of, would that remain with Federal Trade Commission? Uh, again, with respect to the disclosure aspect on the financial side, the disclosure would be unified with the disclosure regime at the new financial agency. All the data security, identity theft and related issues would remain at the FTC uh, and the parallel authorities with respect to, uh, with respect to banks. But, but if, you're, if you're thinking about core issues like spam, spyware, behavioral marketing, we keep all of those. Um, you know, there might be some issues about whether we're going after a malefactor um, or a group of malefactors, and one of them is on the other side of the core new agency's uh, fence. You know, right now there's a 120-day waiting period, um, which we are a little concerned about from the perspective of consumers. But going back to your original point, sort of an, a variety of issues, including sort of the, 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 the core privacy issues we do, um, we'll, we'll be keeping and retaining jurisdiction. Uh, 
Well, I, I think, uh, Mr. Barr, what you should realize with all that expertise in the Federal Trade Commission, Thank you. we're starting a new federal agency here. Um, you know, I would think that, as many have pointed out on this side, we're worried about a new federal agency, particularly when you have an agency that already has the expertise. Um, I think the bill says that the cost of this new uh, development of this new agency is such sums as are necessary. Um, is there any more uh, definitized information you can give on what the cost would be for uh, this new federal agency? Uh, I don't at this time have an overall uh, cost estimate for the agency or size estimate for the agency. It's something we're working on. We'll work with uh, uh, the, the appropriate committees on and with uh, OMB and CBO on. Um, we anticipate that the agency um, will be pulling in staff uh, and resources from the existing agencies and additionally having new resources required. I'd be happy to continue to work with you on that question. Can you talk about the resources the agencies will need besides, uh, I mean, have you identified any of the resources? We, we have begun the process of identifying the number of individuals and the other resources the agency would need, but we are not at a place now uh, where I could give you a, even a reasonable estimate of, uh, of that, um, w what additional measures beyond the transfer authorities would be required. It is something we are working uh, quite, uh, quite hard on. Uh, I'll just close. Mr. Chairman, you might think as a uh, subcommittee chair, since a lot of the expertise for this is already in the Federal Trade Commission and this is a new agency, you might, uh, and particularly your jurisdiction here, uh, I think we've got to move carefully, as Mr. Dinkle pointed out, of developing a brand new agency. They don't know how much they're going to spend. They don't know what resources they're going to need. And also, they're going to be uh, taking uh, on expertise for, for areas they know nothing about that the Federal Trade Commission has years on. So I just wonder, uh, as you as a chairman, you might want to be very careful and cautious about uh, endorsing this new agency without uh, you know, some more hearings on it and try to get more of the stakeholders here, perhaps more than we have on the witness list here, to try and uh, wage, get into the uh, discussion here. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Uh, the Chair observes that there's a vote going on in the, uh, on the floor. There are three votes. Uh, it is the desire of the Chairman that we should, uh, uh, that we should, uh, uh, delay the committee uh, hearing for uh, until after the votes are concluded and then return. I, I'm not sure what the witness, how the witnesses, uh, what their time commitments are, but it would be very important that you return. I would say uh, within 15 minutes after the last vote, then the, the uh, subcommittee will reconvene. So the, the, uh, so the, sub, the subcommittee, is that all right with the uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. This, the subcommittee will reconvene. Uh, the chair uh, recognizes the fact that there might be members of the subcommittee who did not have an opportunity to ask questions of our witnesses in uh, the, uh, before we recess. However, I'm uh, very cognizant of the uh, witnesses' time and would take this time to go into a second round of questioning 
And if there are members who come in who have not asked questions in the first round, then the chair will prolong their questioning for us to seven minutes. Uh, so with that, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for, for two minutes of additional questioning. <coughs> In this white paper describing the proposed regulatory reform, the Department of Treasury stated clearly that, and I quote it, the FTC should retain authority for dealing with fraud in the financial marketplace, in a quote. Despite this assurance, the proposed language appears to weaken FTC's authority in this area. FTC would retain the authority to enforce against unfair and deceptive acts and practices using the FTC Act. However, the FTC could not add any statutory claims, such as the Truth in Lending Act or the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to a complaint without first referring the case to the new agency and waiting 120 days for that agency to decide if it wants to take the case. Uh, Chairman Liverwitz, let me ask you, how will this change impact the FTC's ability to pursue financial fraud? Could the FTC pursue one part of a case while the other is under consideration at CEPA? Or would you expect that it would simply not bother with additional claims? Will the FTC's cases be weakened if they only apply, only rely on FTC Act claims? Well, I, I think I think I'll go back to this mic. Um, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that's a, a, a great question, and and keeping in mind that we're at the beginning of the legislative process, not near the end of the legislative process. Um, those are questions I think that this committee will want to think through as the legislation proceeds forward. Um, it, it, last week, we, we, we brought a bunch of cases which we called um, Operation uh, short, short Change, and it was, about, uh, uh, it was about scams that were hitting people in economic, uh, in economic distress. And, and a lot of those were basically fraud claims under the FTC Act. Uh, but um, one of them involved uh, the electronic Funds Transfer Act under and, and Reg, I think it's Reg E. Um, now Reg E would go to the new agency, and um, and, it, and 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 so th this would sort of invoke two que two parts of your question or two components to your question. One of which is, would we have to wait 120 days to bring this case while there's ongoing harm? And um, and then the second issue is really what is the nature of our backup authority? And, and, and I want to say Mr. Barr and I have been working through this with our staffs and, and very, very productively. You know, I worked on the, on the Hill for 13 years and I never wrote a piece of legislation or for my bosses then uh, that, that didn't change as it went forward. Um, and so, but I think these are precisely the questions uh, that, that we worry about um, at the FTC. Um, we want to make sure, and I know Mr. Barr does too, that, um, that uh, this legislation is as effective as it can be um, for the consumers that all of us uh, re represent. And, um, uh, and so I think uh, it's important that you well, focus on this. Well, it, it seems that the uh, F the FTC, uh, well, the consumers would benefit uh, more if the FTC uh, didn't have to solely rely on the, on the so-called backdrop authority. Do you, do, you, do you agree with that? Well, again, I mean, for, from my perspective, and I, I, you know, I'll turn the mic over to Mr. Barr uh, mm -hmm. in a second, but for, from our perspective, if the backup authority is weak, and, you know, we have backup authority uh, involving uh, the SEC and the CFTC, which we use very rarely, only when we need it. But here, sort of a couple of points. One is, as the transition is happening, if this legislation is created, you want, you know, you, and, and certainly a, even after very good lawyers are transferred and uh, attorneys and jurisdiction, you know, it's going to take a while for this new agency, as Mr. Barr knows better than anyone, to ramp up. And I, 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 like, I, I believe that they're going to want us involved using our backup authority probably 
uh, more earlier than later. Now, we understand that they will be, uh, the, uh, they'll have primary jurisdiction here, but I think it's, uh, it's very important that the backup authority be robust so that we can sort of help out and, and also so that when we have these cases that involve malefactors that don't fit into the uh, old or new silos, uh, that, that we can effectively go forward um, and stop ongoing harm involving consumers. Yeah, before you, Mr. Barr, and the Chair is really cognizant of the fact that his time is almost up, and we'll give him the ranking member whatever time he may consume. But I have just one question. Earlier you stated that you were lo you had lost some personnel. Is these this, this, the individuals that was transferred to Treasury? Uh, we, we have a, um, we have and, had, and, uh, and if, they, if these are the same we individuals. Have one, we have uh, one or two people who've gone over. Uh, and what's the, what's the, what is the purpose of them going over to Treasury? I'm, I'm sorry, what's the? What is their purpose for going over to Treasury? Are they, for, uh, are they transferred, are they on loan to, for, to uh, Treasury, or are they uh, uh, reassigned to Treasury? Oh, I think, I think they're on detail to They're on detail to Treasury. What's the purpose of them being on detail to Treasury? What does that mean? What is the purpose of them being on detail to Treasury? What are they doing over there? Uh, I, I think they're, uh, well, I'll turn that over to Mr. Barr. Um, but I do know that, that the, 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 <laughs> the one person I know who is on detail to Treasury is a fabulous uh, uh, attorney and really cares about consumer protection and also the FTC. All right, well, why don't you turn it over to Mr. Barr and I'll let him <laughs> answer the question. Thank you. Mr. Barr, would you begin your, uh, your answer with that last question and then you can respond to the other question? Sure, and then I'd be happy to address the broader points. Uh, we have uh, on our staff a terrific uh, attorney from the FTC who's uh, come over on detail and is um, uh, going to be um, a, uh, a permanent employee of the Treasury Department working on consumer issues. Oh, yeah. With respect to the broader um, sets of questions, uh, I would just say, uh, first and foremost, um, uh, the Chairman and I are, uh, have been working closely together and are committed to working closely together on, uh, uh, on these sets of issues. Uh, on financial fraud, uh, it's clear from the President's proposal uh, that it would not in any way diminish the FTC's ability uh, to take on financial fraud cases, as is stated in the White Paper and in the legislation. Uh, the FTC would retain its authority uh, and its duty uh, to bring financial fraud cases uh, without delay. With respect to coordination, uh, there are um, many issues that the agencies will want to coordinate on. Uh, the 120-day um, uh, measure is not like the existing um, authorities that the FTC uses where it's the primary uh, entity doing, uh, doing enforcement. Uh, this is an, uh, a proposal that kicks in. If the FTC is doing its work and finds a problem, it can uh, let the new agency know, the consumer agency know about it. It doesn't have to wait as the FTC does today. It doesn't wait until it's gone through its investigation, gone through the whole charging process and gotten it all ready and then refer to the Justice Department. It's totally unlike that. This is a chance for the FTC to let the new agency know about a problem that it sees that's come to its attention. So it's just a, it's a fundamentally different mechanism. We're committed to being sure that that in no way uh, delays any financial fraud um, cases. Uh, and with respect to the transition issues, again, uh, the FTC and the bank agencies will have large transition issues. Uh, we're committed to working those through. Uh, and as I mentioned um, uh, to Representative Schakowsky, uh, Treasury is responsible for ensuring that transition happens smoothly, and you can hold us accountable for that. Uh, with that, the chairman, uh, the, my time is concluded. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> Mr. McDonough is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back. Um, Mr. Lieberman, the uh, Lieberman, excuse me. I, um, uh, uncertainty is one of the key factors behind the perpetuation of our current economic crisis, and granting a new and unknown regulatory agency with this broad scope of power places a dangerous, could place a dangerous level of uncertainty into the financial markets. Do you think that it might be better to have an experienced regulator such as the FTC um, with a long and trusted history of working with business at the helm with these new powers? Well, as you know, I'm very fond of the Federal Trade Commission, as you are. Um, I, I would say this. 
You know, I, I, as you know, I testified here a few months ago that we thought we could do the consumer protection uh, mission involving uh, 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 predatory financial uh, instruments. Um, the proposal that 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 uh, uh, that has been developed, though, is one that is broader than that. It has uh, it has bank examiner components. It has. Uh, um, it has uh, compliance proponents. So those are not things in our core competency. Um, I, you know, again, we are a creature of Congress. We're an independent agency. And, um, and so we will, you know, we will do uh, whatever uh, you tell us we're going to do. And, um, and then beyond that, I, I would say this. I just want to come back to my initial point, which is based on what we've seen in this marketplace and the restrictions that we've operated under, um, I do think that uh, a, 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 with these, these issues work through, and I believe they will be. I, I, I do think that having, um, uh, that having this new uh, agency and the FTC both going after unfairness, deception, fraud is, 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 is considerably preferable to the status quo. And we, we agree on that. I mean, I, I think the issue is how you go about it. I, yeah, I will I, say, though, that meeting with the bankers in my district back home, they're afraid of this. And that's, I think that's the, 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 the uncertainty question is a legitimate question. And, well, I, I, if it I do. Does, and, and if it does bring the specter of increased regulatory uh, management over the industry, not that something has to be done in order to get uh, to mistake the correct, uh, correct the mistakes of uh, the last year, but you know what's it going to do to the to the industry's willingness to to get out there and unfreeze uh, liquidity like we're all wanting to? I'm happy if you want to respond. If, but, if yeah. I could just uh, add to the uh, to Chairman Leewitz's comment on that, I, I think that uh, it, it, a key new factor is this: this agency would have all the supervisory and examination authority it needs not just with respect to banks, but also with respect to non-bank competitors of those banks. So I understand that many banks are worried about the scope of the new Consumer Financial Protection Agency. I appreciate those concerns. I think the additional upside for them is that their non-bank competitors will have uh, the same high standard that they need to meet, the same level playing field, the same consistent rules. So they don't have to worry. Community bank and a credit union doesn't have Pardon to worry me, about that. That kind of tells me that you're just broadening the uncertainty in the, in to, to include the entire financial markets. You're not. No, I think know, what we're able to do, sir, with respect is to. It seems to me the uncertainty is being uh, broadened, not. That doesn't answer the question about uncertainty and that the banks. Uh, are, are afraid of this kind of legislation. I think what we're able to do is create a high, consistent, clear standard. We're able to reduce regulatory burden in many cases. For example, combining the teal and rest reforms that drive everybody crazy and don't help consumers. We need a single, uniform, simple standard for disclosure. I, that I'd, I'd suggest that, that you need to convince the banks because they're the ones that are expressing the the real concern. If I may, though, Mr. Barr, I do have a, a, a second question, and that is that uh, President Obama has stated that stream, a, a streamlined system will provide better oversight and less costly, and will be less costly for regulated institutions. But the preemption statutes in the bill in, uh, create a floor rather than a ceiling for state regulation. Doesn't that mean we're looking at 51 different versions of this thing by giving? Uh, the preemption statutes to the state, and how does that does that n not conflict with President Obama's statement that we're looking at a streamlined system? Well, as you know, the states have played long played an important role in consumer protection. I think one of the upsides of living in our country is that we have independent states that but make they haven't independent had judgments about. They have not had preemptive status in this situation before. The, they have not been able to apply uh, state laws in some context to national banks, uh, but they certainly have been very active in the consumer area across lots of different products and services in the past. Do you think and that our, could lead to 51 different uh, versions of this throughout I, the state? I think we're much more likely to see a, a high standard uh, at the national level. I think it's very rare if you set a high, good high standard at the national level, you're going to find it very rare for states uh, to go off in their own way. But sometimes states are right. Sometimes states protect consumers in innovative ways. And our view is we shouldn't block the state's ability to do what the states think and their judgment is right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
the chair thanks the witnesses, uh, and we want to thank you for, oh boy, no, we don't. Um, the chairman recognizes Dr. Gingrey for seven minutes for the purposes of questioning. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your generosity of time. I'm sorry I w missed the first round, and I appreciate you letting me ask some questions. And I did want to uh, ask Secretary Barr, uh, in your testimony, you indicated that we need only one agency charged with protecting consumers for financial products and services. As one of the principal architects of the administration's plan and the proposed Consumer Financial Protection Agency, you lay out a very broad and sweeping changes that will fundamentally change a number of government entities, of course, including the FTC. However, while this is still in the early stages, there are some concerns held by members, including me, uh, that an overly broad new regulatory agency will have the same effect of hitting a nail with a sledgehammer. Uh, in these efforts, under the guise of uniformity, I feel that there may be some different standards set for industries within this proposed agencies. For example, uh, I've heard that uh, some suggestion that small banks uh, should be exempt from some or all of the rules written by the proposed agency. Uh, and the drafted legislation contains exempted authority based on asset size. Uh, is it the administration's plan to apply different consumer protections depending on whether a customer transacts with a small or a large bank? Uh, and furthermore, if you intend to carve out smaller institutions, what are the types of rules they would be exempted from, and what is the policy reason for carving out these institutions? Uh, thank you very uh, much for that set of questions. I do think that uh, our proposal does involve sweeping change, uh, sweeping change that in our judgment is essential to protect consumers. Our, our old system was fundamentally broken, and we do need fundamental reform. Uh, with respect to um, smaller institutions, uh, we don't expect to see, would not uh, expect that small banks and big banks would have different rules of disclosure. Uh, but you may see differences in, say, how much examination or supervision uh, there would be. In the bigger institutions, as we do today, on site, there are examiners on site year round. You wouldn't want that for a small bank. So you may see differences like that, but not differences in the basic standards affecting consumers. Those would be uniform across the board. So if you walk into a bank or you walk into a credit union, you walk into a big bank, or you go to your independent mortgage broker, um, or you go to an independent mortgage company, you get the same simple mortgage disclosure so consumers can understand what they're getting. Uh, Chairman Leibowitz, uh, as you outlined in your testimony, uh, there, there will be a number of changes to the FTC as a result of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, if that becomes law. Many responsibilities will be pulled from the current jurisdiction of the FTC and be given to this new agency. Uh, and with all of these proposed changes, what then will be the role of the FTC in this new landscape, and, and how much of that new role will be duplicative uh, of this proposed agency. You guys have been doing a good job. You know, you, we, we are appreciative of that. And, and, and we appreciate, you know, and, and are heartened by uh, what you said about our agency. I do think we do a good job, and we have terrific attorneys who really care about enforcing the mission of the agency and good commissioners who are also committed. Um, you know, we'll still have, let me just say, we'll still have all of our competition authority, right, our antitrust authority. We will continue to do all the other things we do, whether it's fraud or uh, privacy outside of the financial context uh, or, you know, advertising and marketing practices. And, and then we'll continue to stay involved here, uh, I think, especially uh, during uh, the transition period and, and, and hopefully beyond with concurrent jurisdiction. Um, you know, look, there are, as we know in this room, and as you guys know better than anybody else, there are a lot of bad actors out there who are, you know, trying to rip off American consumers. And so, you know, by growing uh, the, the federal ability to go after these malefactors, I, you know, I, that can only help even the playing field, right? I mean, what we, we do at the FTC, and I think we do it really well, but it's a sort of triage, right? You know, we look at different cases, potential cases, and whereas we're going through an investigation, and we say, which one can we best leverage? 
Which are the ones that, you know, are the greatest harm to the greatest number of people? Which are the ones that might make better, uh, uh, change bad case law, for example? And we're always making decisions based on sort of the lack of resources that we have. We just try to do the best job. Well, that, well you know. let me reclaim my time just sure. for a second. I did want to ask you one other question. I, you look, we don't disagree uh, with the need for, for oversight, but it seems to me that uh, in this current financial crisis that we're in and all of these uh, bad loans and uh, uh, toxic uh, assets and all of that, that uh, the oversight it got really heavy after the, the horse had already left the barn. Right. Uh, and so that's kind of a concern. And, and there's always uh, the concern that the oversight uh, it becomes too much so restrictive after the fact uh, that these institutions, particularly your small banks and lending institutions, can't function. Uh, and I certainly see this across my district uh, in, in privately held banks, smaller banks, that. Uh, uh, the oversight should have been steady and consistent, uh, and it always should be, but yet, you know, when some, some catastrophe occurs because somebody was not minding the store, then all of a sudden the oversight comes uh, uh, down on these institutions to the point that uh, uh, all of a sudden they go out of business, it hurts the local community. And, uh, but let, let me just ask you, in the, in the little bit of time I've got left, you, you mentioned to us what the FTC would be able to continue to do. Mm -hmm. uh, what percentage of what you currently do is that? Does that represent 50 percent of your current responsibilities, 25 percent? Are you losing more than 50 percent of what you currently are charged to do? No, no, no. I, you know, I think it would be more like in terms of, if I, if I think it through in terms of resources, I, I'll get back to you with a, uh, with, I'll get back to you with a response, but I would say it is more like it is more like five to ten percent of what we do, and 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 of course it's been it's been an area as you know that we've been concentrating on more and more because it's very important to American consumers. Many of whom are suffering from uh, you know all, many of them, almost all of them, are suffering from something. Well, well, I, I would economy. I would appreciate if you I, would I'll specifically not, get back to. I think it's important that we know that. It is, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your your patience and generosity, and thank the witnesses. The chair, again, the chair thanks the witnesses for the uh, use of their time. You were very generous uh, to us in terms of using your time, and we want to know that you have really contributed significantly uh, to uh, this process, and we are better off because you uh, uh, testified today and to help us move along on this uh, propo new proposal. And so we will uh, be in touch with you uh, in, in, uh, in the future. Uh, and the chair wants you to know that uh, we will, uh, uh, there will be, a, we will give a members 72 hours to ask, the, to ask questions uh, in writing. And if you will respond to them within uh, a reasonable amount of time, the chair really, really appreciate it. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair welcomes uh, the second panel <coughs> to the desk and to the, uh, this hearing. Uh, and Chair apologize for the inconveniences that you might have had to endure while we were uh, on the floor of voting. Uh, and the Chair is very respectful and, and appreciative of the fact that you've come from far and wide to be here uh, to testify. I want to introduce our witnesses, and I'll begin uh, on my left. Uh, Ms. Gail Hillebrand is a senior attorney and a manager for the financial services campaign for the Consumers Union. Uh, seated next to her is Mr. Stephen Calkins, Esquire. He's the associate vice president for academic personnel and professor of law at Wayne State University. Uh, next to him is Mr. Prentice, Prentice Cox, 
who is an associate clinical professor of law at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and seated next to Mr. Cox is Ms. Rachel E. Barkow. Uh, and Ms. Barkow is a professor of law at New York University School of Law. And last but not least, the gentleman uh, with the smiling face uh, next to her is Mr. Chris Steinbert. And Mr. Steinbert is the president and CEO of American Financial Services Association. We will, again, we want to thank you and welcome you to uh, this committee hearing. It is the practice of this committee that we swear in witnesses. So, so would you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, let the record reflect that all the witnesses respond in the affirmative. Uh, now it is my privilege uh, to uh, allow you uh, to recognize you five minutes for an opening statement. So, uh, Ms. Hillebrand, we'll start with you. Yeah, turn, it, turn the mic on and pull it close to you, please. Thank you. Chairman Rush, Ranking Mem Member Radonovich, and members of the committee, you know Consumers Union as the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports, but our mission is to test, inform, protect, and empower consumers, and that's the role in which I appear before you today. My written testimony was joined by six national consumer organizations. Uh, consumer, consumer groups want, and consumers in the U.S. need, a strong consumer financial protection agency, a robust Federal Trade Commission, and a strong role for states in consumer protection in financial services. We believe that those goals are entirely consistent with one another. The goal is a better financial services marketplace and better government in financial services oversight. Uh, we have to face it. The current system doesn't work. It's not delivering products or encouraging products that are understandable to consumers who use them or that meet the reasonable expectations created in the sales process. Instead, we have gotcha banking. We have multiple regulators by type of provider, even when those providers are competing directly for the very same consumer. We have long delays for regulatory action. And we don't have much of open public enforcement except by the FTC. And finally, we have abusive features in products that are squeezing their way through the holes in the existing law and the existing regulatory scheme. I believe the job of government is to serve the people. We're not here to talk about more government. We're here to talk about better government in financial services oversight. Spreading today, our system just isn't designed to do the job. It's spread out over six or more agencies with a hodgepodge of rules and statutes. And how much enforcement uh, a provider receives depends in part on who its regulator is. That is just not a system designed to match the realities of today's market. We want to give the federal government a different and new job in financial services marketplace and that's to promote a fair as well as an efficient financial services market, to watch for the market to prevent harms as they start to develop. I come from the great state of California where the option arm and some of the other products that have gone so terribly sideways were pioneered. And you can only wonder if someone had been watching those markets more closely whether that would have spread around the country. The mandate of the CFPA is the right mandate, is to promote transparency, simplicity, fairness, with accountability and access. And notice I say promote. It's a different job from what the federal government has had before. And with the CFPA, we have the opportunity for an agency that has an obligation to get information, to learn about the market, to watch that market, and then to make a conscious decision about what needs to be regulated and what doesn't, and which regulatory tools to use, and then to apply those tools evenly no matter who's providing the product. With the CFPA, we could get one agency to watch over the market, faster acting responses, one agency that's responsible to you and to me when things go wrong, and one place for your constituents to go instead of the alphabet soup they have now of trying to figure out who to complain to and who to get relief from. The CFPA model is one federal rulemaker but multiple enforcers, and that brings me to the incredibly important continuing role of the FTC. I'd like to disclose, Mr. Chairman, I was once a summer law intern at the Bureau of Competition at the FTC uh, longer ago than could possibly be relevant for today, but I want to disclose that. Um, 
The FTC keeps its enforcement authority. It keeps its Section 5 authority with a simple, regardless of the topic, financial services or not, with a, a simple consultation that can be at the staff-to-staff -staff level. It keeps its authority with respect to all the statutes it now has with that referral process. And I think it's very important to note that's a refer and wait process, but you're, they're not waiting for a yes or no. If the CFPA does not take on a case the FTC needs to be, thinks needs to be brought, it can still bring that case. The CFPA cannot say no. Uh, we have made a recommendation to you in the written testimony that the statute should allow the CFPA to waive that notice or to shorten it by individual case, by type or category of case, and by agency so that they can work these things out where uh, there's commonly, for example, the telemarketer case with the EFTA claim. And we also are recommending to you that the FTC be given the authority to uh, be a secondary regulator with respect to enforcing the CFPA rules, not writing them, but enforcing them. The FTC does lose jurisdiction to write unfair and deceptive acts and practices rules in financial services, but that has not been a role they've been able to use widely uh, in, the, in the last couple decades since the credit practices rule, which was, went into effect in the 80s. They keep all of their enforcement, and of course it will be made stronger with the aiding and abetting enforcement. We believe this is the only way to put all the competing products under the same um, set of rules. I have some examples, but I'll hold them for the Q&A because I'm conscious of your time. And I do want to say that I think it's very important what the FTC does right now in the recession. It's very important what the FTC will continue to do after the transfer of authority in those cases where there's overlapping enforcement. And it will be extremely important what the FTC does with its additional authority. Um, there are a lot of things the FTC can do right now to help consumers who are suffering from the recession, including cleaning up the problem with credit reporting errors, the work it's now beginning to do under the new authority you gave it, the mortgage modification and foreclosure, debt collection and debt settlement. All those things will remain extremely important. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kaufman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Rush, ranking member. Would you pull the mic closer to me, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Is that all right? Yes. It's not on. It's, it's not it's not on. on. Push the button. Push the button. Thank yes. you. Uh -huh. Uh, special thanks for uh, the technological advice here. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Radonovich, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here to testify about this important matter. Uh, the proposed legislation uh, would affect sweeping changes in the Federal Trade Commission. The key to the bill is in the definitions, and they are written extremely broadly. Applying those definitions and working your way through the bill you find that the bill would transfer out of the Federal Trade Commission much of the work that the Federal Trade Commission now does, giving those responsibilities to the new agency and uh, giving it the exclusive authority to prescribe rules and issue guidance with respect to much of what the Bureau of Consumer Protection does. If you take the FTC's most recent annual report for 2009 and turn to consumer protection, and start reading what they have been doing. Subprime credit, mortgage servicing, foreclosure rescue, fair lending, mortgage advertising, debt collection, payday lending, Operation Clean Sweep, uh, Operation Telephony, the Santasia marketing case, payment systems, the Neovi case, nationwide connections case, global marketing case, and so on and so forth, prepaid phone cards. Um, on matter after matter after matter of what they have been doing, uh, I read the bill as saying that all of that would be transferred to the new agency. In short, we would have major change. Indeed, if you read the bill carefully, you would find that even some of the antitrust responsibility of the commission would be transferred. I assume that's a mistake, but that's how it is currently written. Now, why have this sweeping change in what the Federal Trade Commission does? It might make sense if the Federal Trade Commission was a bad agency that was doing bad work. But as you all have spoken so eloquently this morning, the Federal Trade Commission is a good agency that has been doing good work. It has a unique bipartisan structure. It combines consumer protection and competition to bring the best from both perspectives to bear on problems. And it has been doing important work for consumers, including in the world of credit, for a very, very long time. 
uh, transferring responsibility from the Federal Trade Commission to another agency obviously creates some pretty significant risks. And my recommendation to you is to proceed with great caution to weigh those risks, to decide whether they are really worth running, and uh, certainly if they are, to work very hard to try to minimize those risks, because the bill as written would make major changes, and uh, you need to be very careful to make sure that all of this makes sense. Thanks very much, and I am happy to answer questions when the time comes. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Cox, you are recognized for five minutes. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Radonovich. Um, abuses of consumer finance products were a disaster for millions of consumers before anyone recognized them because we had a financial crisis. A disaster. Uh, a previous testimony about someone committing suicide, I sat with people whose families committed suicide after I worked with them, who had heart attacks from the stress. Millions of people experienced this. Our Federal regulatory system did not respond to this. It was dominated completely by the thinking and needs of the lenders and sellers and not by what was happening on the ground. It is often said that no one could have seen this. The people who were working with the victims of subprime lending and were talking to people who reflected the experience of those people as well as the others who were subject to the abuses of consumer finance products absolutely knew what was going on and were screaming at the top of our lungs. No one was listening. It was predictable and it was preventable. The Consumer Finance Protection Agency, as proposed, offers the first hope in generations, uh, certainly in my adult lifetime working on these issues. For an agency with sufficient power and focus on consumer protection issues to seriously address these problems. It gets it right in terms of its model. It sets up a unified rulemaking process. It's not about whether the FTC was good or bad. It's about the fragmentation of authority and the lack of perspective in a unified rulemaker. It gets it right in setting a floor and allowing innovation where innovation should occur, which is in the state regulatory system. And it couples that with an open enforcement system. It allows the enforcement of those clear, unified rules to occur in multiple places. And there are two reasons you want that. The first is that you can pair the proper enforcement agency, public enforcement agency, with the problem at hand. If you've got a problem that just occurs in Indiana, the Indiana Attorney General is the right place to do it. It simply won't get, take, won't get taken care of if you allow a federal agency. Conversely, if the Indiana Attorney General turns up a problem that appears to be nationwide, that can highlight the need for the agency. Secondly, the um, agencies like the FTC and State Attorney Generals often will bring violations of rules ancillary, which is what Chairman Leibowitz was saying, ancillary to other investigations because these things don't come up in little neat silos. So an open public enforcement model, which is what this bill has by allowing the Federal Trade Commission and other federal agencies to enforce the rules and State Attorney Generals to enforce the rules, enhances enforcement. I will make two quick comments, one about the details of the enforcement mechanisms and the other about the rulemaking and investigative authority. The open enforcement mechanisms in the bill are excellent. However, uh, I agree completely with Chairman Leibowitz that uh, the 120 days restrictions on the FTC is way too cumbersome. It needs to be streamlined and made more efficient. Secondly, and this is, I think is a very important point, in the bill as currently constructed, the FTC is given the authority to enforce extant cons federal consumer credit laws, but not the regulations passed by the CFPA. The CFPA regulations over time will become much more important than the extant consumer credit regulations. It's really critical that the FTC get the authority to enforce the regulations that are passed by the CFPA. There's also a consulting power in there. It, it uh, uh, requirement, and that's correct, and I hope that on an informal basis, the agency takes account of the fact that the FTC, which enforces UDAP, unfair and deceptive acts and practices laws, gains a particular type of experience and understanding that's vital, that's vital to setting those rules. Secondly, state AGs have authority, but that uh, uh, mechanisms for remedies need to be clarified. 
uh, because right now the Section 1055 powers, it's unclear whether those are bootstrapped into the AG enforcement. Finally, in its rulemaking authority, the new CFPA desperately needs detailed and express and clear investigatory powers. Otherwise, the data that is brought to bear and what the rules are will be data held by the industry that the CFPA simply doesn't have access to. So it's critical that the CFPA have that investigative power so that they can get the rules right the first time. I really appreciate the opportunity to be at this historic hearing and wish the Congress great luck in making this project work. Thank you very much. Ms. Barkov. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Radonovich, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. I'm honored to have the opportunity to discuss this piece of legislation. The linchpin of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency Act is, of course, the agency it creates. So whether this act will succeed or fail in its mission to protect consumers will depend entirely on whether the agency it creates will succeed or fail. I've therefore analyzed the structure and powers of the proposed CFPA to determine if it has been designed in the most effective way to achieve its stated statutory mission. I take no position on the merits of that mission or whether there is a need for a new agency to regulate this field. Rather, my focus is on whether the CFPA has been designed as effectively as it can be to achieve that mission. In that regard, I'd like to make six brief suggestions and observations about the design of the CFPA in this legislation. My first recommendation, and the most important, is to add a provision to this act that would limit the CFPA board's membership to no more than three members of the same political party. Unlike virtually all other legislation that governs multi-member independent regulatory agencies, including the FTC, the SEC, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the CFPA Act, as it's currently written, does not require political balance among the agency's membership. There is a wealth of empirical studies that are demonstrating that a group comprised solely of ideologically like-minded people tends toward extreme decision-making. Without a provision in the CFPA Act requiring partisan balance, the CFPA is likely to change positions from one extreme to another with each new presidential administration. This is unhealthy for the regulation of any market and certainly the consumer financial products market. A political balance requirement can serve as a stabilizing force. In addition, a political balance requirement can lead to dissenting opinions, which is valuable for alerting Congress and the public if the agency goes in uh, extreme direction one way or the other. Second, I suggest amending the Act's requirement that the CFPA consult with all federal banking agencies and any other relevant agency before passing rules to make sure those rules will be consistent with the prudential, market, or systemic objectives of the agencies being consulted. Because this consultation requirement sweeps so broadly, covering every conceivable agency regulating related fields and anything of any importance to those agencies, this process is likely to dramatically delay the promulgation of CFPA rules. This is precisely the kind of requirement that aids industry participants in tying up agency rules for years. So unless Congress is of the view that the delay in legal uncertainty is outweighed by the benefits of this provision, I suggest making clear that consultation is at the discretion of the CFPA and not subject to judicial review. Third, I advise modifying the statute of limitations provision in the Act to begin running from the time the CFPA discovers a violation, not from the time a violation has occurred. Because violations by sophisticated business interests are not discovered for years in many cases, this provision as it's currently written might hamper the CFPA in its enforcement efforts. Fourth, uh, I recommend including a limitation on the ability of CFPA board members to practice before the CFPA for a period of time after their service on the board has expired. This kind of restriction would limit the negative effects that are often caused by having a revolving door between agencies and the industries that they regulate. Fifth, I just would like to highlight a protection in the Act that I think is going to be critical to achieving the Act's law enforcement objectives, and that's Section 1042 of the Act, which allows the State Attorneys General to enforce the provisions. State AGs have demonstrated in many areas that they can be effective law enforcement partners, and I think this is particularly true in the area of consumer protection, where agency capture is a significant risk. Finally, I'd like to alert the subcommittee's attention to the fact that it's unclear from this act as it's currently written whether the CFPA will be subject to presidential directives and oversight, including review by the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, known as OIRA. There is language in the act that suggests this is actually going to be an executive agency and will be subject to this kind of oversight. 
Congress may intend for the CFPA to be part of the President's oversight process, but if not, the Act would need to be rewritten to make clear that the CFPA is an independent regulatory agency for purposes of OIRA review. I take no position on whether or not the agency should be subject to this type of review, uh, but because it's a fundamental question, I note for you that it's currently unclear in the legislation. Thank you again for allowing me to testify and share my thoughts on this uh, proposed legislation, and I'd be happy to answer questions when we're all done speaking. Uh, Mrs. Steinberg. Thank well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm very glad to hear that this is kind of a first step and hopefully which will be a long process because uh, as many have expressed here today, there are certainly some concerns uh, uh, about this, uh, this issue and we hope that there will continue to be somewhat of a cautious approach as, as we go forward. Uh, the American Financial Services Association has been around for almost 100 years and uh, we represent about 30% of all consumer credit uh, in, in the U.S with members in the mortgage, credit card, auto, and uh, uh, personal installment loans. Uh, first and foremost, AFSA supports strong financial consumer protection regulation. Uh, just because we have concerns going forward about the, uh, the current agency does not mean that the industry and that the association is not committed to strong um, uh, consumer protection regulation regarding financial services. We believe that consistent enforcement of existing consumer protection laws by government regulators would have greatly lessened the harmful impact that the current crisis has on consumers and certainly our economy. Many AFSA members are regulated primarily at the state level and subject to a patchwork of requirements. We firmly believe that consumer protections should be uniform in every state. Therefore, AFSA supports strong national consumer protection standards that allow the members to meet their consumer protection obligation in an efficient and cost-effective manner. In addition, strong national consumer protection standards will provide a benefit to consumers only to the extent that they are consistent with sound potential regulation. Consumer protections that threaten the safety and soundness of financial service providers offers real no protection at all. We believe consumer, consumers will be better served by a regulatory structure where potential, potential and consumer protection regulations are housed within a single regulator. Congress tried to separate these two intertwining functions with the GSEs. When it became apparent that this situation was unavoidable, Congress brought the two regulatory functions back under a single regulator, and for good reason. We urge Congress to support regulatory structure that does not separate safety and soundness from consumer protection. The authority pr proposed to be vested in the new agency is breathtaking in both its scope and its effect. It would cover many entities and persons who have little or no involvement in the activities leading to the current economic crisis. Without any demonstrated need, many unsuspecting persons will be swept into a web of scrutiny and reporting requirements that yield little in the way of consumer protection, but much in the way of increased cost for consumers. Attorneys, accountants, consumer reporting agency, auto dealers, title companies, among others, will find themselves subject to review with no evidence that they behaved unfairly. Financial service providers will find it increasingly difficult to plan for risk, as virtually any practice or product other than prescribed standard plain vanilla products could be labeled as unfair or abusive. Innovation will be discouraged. Given the vast scope of the proposed agency's authority, its funding needs are also staggering. The proposal seeks to fund the CFPA by assessing fees on persons and entity it regulates, while including many that would not expect to be covered currently. There is no doubt that any assessment on financial service products will be passed on eventually to consumers. That direct, unavoidable result will be an increase in the cost and availability of credit. Most AFSA members are regulated by the FTC, 
which has a proven record of enhancing consumer protection. It has addressed the economic crisis in two ways. First, by using the enforcement authority to pursue bad actors in the financial services industry. And second, by setting federal policy through guidance and public comment. Numerous examples are listed in our written testimony. But in conclusion, AFSA believes that the FTC has done an excellent job in enforcing consumer protection laws and is best suited to continue that role going forward. We believe the administration's goal can be achieved with adjustments to the current regulatory structure and the result will be more efficient, less costly, and certainly more effective. To that end, we have two specific suggestions. One, make current and future consumer protection rules apply to all financial services providers. Congress should ensure that all federal consumer protection laws and regulations apply with equal force to all providers of financial services with respect to similar cases of products and services. These laws should include strong national standards that preempt state laws and permit all Americans to enjoy consistent level of services and access with respect to financial products and services. We've heard again and again and again today, as you have 50 different states that can exceed or, or uh, um, uh, meet or exceed the current laws, that this is not simplification. We're just going to wind up with 51, as you stated, Mr. Chairman, 51 different rules that uh, these people are going to have to follow. And number two, pursue a regulatory structure that does not separate financial products and services from the viability of the companies that offer them. All prudential agencies should work together to coordinate consumer protection regulation for financial products and services with the goal that regulations be pre preemptive, consistent, and uniform. If we don't have that, we're not going to make any headway. Thank you for your time. The chair thanks the witnesses, and the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for questioning. According to the administration's proposals, uh, proposal rather, the states will be able to enforce the statutes uh, and rules being transferred to the new agency right away. Uh, in contrast, the FTC will be required to provide uh, the CFPA with notice of a proposed action, and uh, as has been stated earlier, wait 120 days for the CPFA to determine if it would take the case before it take any action. This applies to the very rules and laws currently enforced by the FTC. Uh, Mr. Calkins, uh, in your testimony, <clears throat> you suggest that this four-month delay will prevent uh, the FTC from ever investigating or taking action in these areas. Uh, can you explain uh, and expound upon that, please? When I read the bill, I sat and tried to think about what life would be like under the new legislation and the 120-day rule. What would the FTC do? And as I thought about it and I read the bill, I read where the bill says, quote, all consumer financial protection functions of the Federal Trade Commission are transferred to the other agency. So who at the FTC is going to be doing the work to find that there is a violation that they wish to use the 120-day rule to develop. Maybe the FTC will go out and develop new resources to do this. Does that make sense? And I don't think that makes sense because the whole point of the bill, it appears, is to transfer a large part of what the FTC does to this new agency. Let's talk about the 120-day rules. Well, we have experience with the FTC and the Department of Justice where the FTC can ask the Justice Department to bring a civil penalty action for it, 45 days there. The reality is that the FTC, although I'm not sure they would admit it, goes out of its way 
to avoid using that authority. It is a lot more effective and efficient for the Commission to go directly to court, bring an action, take action against the wrongdoer, stop a fraud, stop some harm, get relief. And so they use the authority they can use by themselves. And time and again, they don't go to the Department of Justice. I think that that 120-day authority will be very rarely used in the new world. It's really there in case we have a new agency that is so opposed to enforcing these rules that an FTC might come along and try to develop some sort of alternative world as a backstop. But I, I think that the world that I see would have the FTC using this authority very, very rarely. And I just do not think that is the vision contemplated by the bill as written. Uh, <clears throat> does there any other witness uh, want to ch uh, chime in here? Uh, uh, is, there, is this a shared skepticism on the part of the other witnesses? Uh, Ms. Ms. Barkow, do you, uh, are you skeptical of this uh, backdrop rule? It does seem like 120 days would be the equivalent of a lifetime in this kind of an industry where you're talking about the word well, if it was 60, assets well, disappearing. If, if it was 60 days, would that make a real difference? Well, that, that I leave to the, the FTC to decide, but the fact that they're worried about the 120 days, I think, speaks volumes about the fact that it's probably going to be a significant issue. Anyone else want to chime in here on this? Well, I think it... If you look at some of the discussion that occurred earlier, and they were talking about the number of days, but perhaps more importantly, look at the actual structure. They've, they've taken so many of the personnel, the team has been taken from the FTC and is now part of the new agency. And yet they're supposed to maintain the backstop or the backup in these areas. But the team is gone. And as uh, Mr. Calkins suggested all they can do is go out and rehire new experts that are supposed to be the backup. It doesn't sound like a very good system to me. Ms. Ms. Hildebrand. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under the one rule writing many enforcers model, we want it to be as easy as possible for the FTC to bring the cases in its existing jurisdiction as well as to enforce the CFPA rules. If the commission recommends a shorter time period, we would want you to look at that very seriously. We think a waiver process also could help there. The commission and the CFPA could agree that for this kind of case, we don't need to know in advance, and for these other cases, we need a shorter period. Okay, the chair, this time is uh, concluded. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Rodanovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Calkins, the proposed legislation defines a covered entity to include those who provide tax planning, financial and other related advisory services, or uh, provide educational courses and instruction materials to consumers. Uh, PBS is often runs a, a, such programming on TV for their audiences, as do financial cable stations and radio stations. Would these entities be covered persons under the proposed legislation, in your opinion? Um. Uh, certainly there is a risk that they would be covered persons. Certainly the Commission would have to think about whether it was required to transfer responsibility for all those. And then, very important, even if they are not covered entities today, the new agency has authority to define for itself additional activities that it would have jurisdiction over. Right. And so even if the FTC didn't have to transfer authority today, they might have to transfer authority a year from now when the definitions got changed. Thank you, Mr. Calkins. Can you, um, I want you to comment on, on a, a prior statement about the FTC's bipartisanship and way it conducts its activities and how that's good. Can you, can you elaborate on that and how the lack of bipartisanship might hinder the CFPA's ability to effectively carry out what is now the FTC's mission? Well, the FTC, I think, has over the years developed credibility with Congress, with uh, the states, uh, with international observers because it operates in a bipartisan way. Uh, the commissioners try to work by consensus. They try to take the actions that make the most sense. Uh, when somebody wants to go out on a limb and be really wild and crazy to the left or the right, there's someone from the other side to pull them back in. Um, as noted before, uh, Ms. Barkow, uh, when you have uh, people going too far, dissents can be filed. And it, it, uh, 
it succeeds in developing a shared understanding of the sensible way to proceed, and then as presidents come and go, uh, there exists some continuity, um, and that continuity, I think, adds credibility to the agency's operations and really has made it into a more effective agency. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Barco, would you care to respond to that question as well? Oh, I, I agree completely, and I think that the whole idea of an independent regulatory agency, which I think is part of the goal in this legislation, is to have that kind of consensus generating form of norms that transcend any particular presidential administration so that you don't have the instability that comes with every new presidential administration means sweeping changes one way or the other. You, you have a stabilizing force in an agency that has membership from both parties. I think it's, it's proven to be effective in other contexts and it's, it's hard to understand why you would have a multi-member agency here that doesn't have that mix of political views on it. I mean, why not just mm -hmm. then have a single member Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Steinberg, I, I, I want to ask you about uncertainty in the financial markets, this massive shift from, of responsibility and the creation of the new agency on consumer, consumer protections. Your bird's eye view on the industry, how it would react to something like this, uh, and the level of uncertainty that it might bring into the markets where uncertainty is, is we're trying to do everything to avoid uncertainty. Um, would you comment on that, please? Well, uh, some might argue that this is the perfect time to do something like this. I think it's absolutely the worst time. We're finally starting to see some stability in the financial markets. We're starting to see some recovery. We're starting to see investors come back into the uh, into the marketplace, which eventually investors have to buy these 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 loans out there. Uh, in in Europe and the U.S., we're starting to see movement back in there. This does introduce a whole level of uncertainty back into the, uh, the whole arena because uh, people are now going to stand back and, and wait and see what goes on, whether there is additional liabilities, requirements, and regulations on these, uh, on these entities. Right. So yes, I, I do agree that it's going to bring uh, a new level of uncertainty into the marketplace at the worst possible time for that. Can you describe a scenario where the duplicative regulatory authorities allowed by this Act's weak preemption provision might actually prevent consumers from access to, the vi to, to valuable financial services? This is the state preemption issue where you'd have 50 different, 51 different. Right now it, it's set up as basically a, a, a floor or a standard that uh, states will have the ability to exceed. Uh, someone will make a judgment uh, uh, whether what the state is trying to do is meeting or exceeding. Uh, I'm assuming that would be this, uh, the new agency. Mm -hmm. But if a determination is made by them that it exceeds it, of course, anything that they would do to exceed would be permitted. So I think you've seen it in many other instances. Uh, I'll give you the most recent, the new SAFE Act. That was the licensing for residential mortgage uh, originators. Uh, you basically have out there in the implementation of that law 50 different standards that everyone's trying to meet, and each of them, many of them, uh, exceeding the, uh, the federal guidelines. So people that are regulated at the state level or have to uh, register in multiple states as, as originators are going to have to follow very, very many different laws. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. <clears throat> Mr. Sobbins. Maryland, I'm sorry. Oh, boy. In Maryland. We're, we're trying to get to Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> we got one Republican left. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Steinberg, you said this is absolutely the wrong time. What would be a good time? Well, I, I, I think when you go back, and, and w there's plenty of history uh, to point fingers at uh, what was the cause of the subprime mortgage uh, uh, crisis and the current, currently economic crisis, but I don't think you'd get anybody that would, uh, that would predict that uh, whatever is done here today or even by Congress, that you can control every bubble that is going to occur in the future. Uh, most economists would agree that, yes, this bubble was a housing bubble, before it was a tech bubble, before that it was a, a, a savings and loan bubble. There, there, you cannot have government totally controlling financial markets unless they can totally control potential bu bubbles, unless you totally stymie innovation and all you have is a vanilla, plain vanilla standard product out there. 
and I don't think that's good for the very consumers that we're trying to protect here. I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I don't think you can have government totally controlling every single financial dimension in the market. don't think you can do that. I don't think this tries to do that. I think what this tries to do is, is provide some oversight and direction and rules of the road <clears throat> so that people stop driving off the road, um, not only because in the view of Alan Greenspan that causes the drivers to crash and hurt themselves, but because they run over hundreds of thousands of innocent bystanders in the, in the process. Um, let me switch back to a discussion from, from a few minutes ago, because I think it's very relevant. As attractive as the new agency may be to some, and I'm partial to it as it's, as it's being described, uh, we still have to get from here to there. And I worry a lot because even if we had in place now the, the regulatory structure that we thought um, was necessary, it would have to be in overdrive, I would argue, to be on the lookout against uh, predatory action um, that's, that's lurking out there. But certainly in a transitional phase, predators have uh, a lot of opportunities to make mischief. And I think the discussion about the 120 days kind of points to some of this anxiety. But I'd like anyone who would, who would care to, um, I'd like to hear you respond to the idea of some kind of a special initiative or task force or consciousness that during this transition, um, we need to be a paying attention to, maybe it's a limited set of activities um, or potential mischief, but that there's got to be a special focus on that so that we don't make the transition say, now we've got a good regulatory structure in place. But in the meantime, while that happened, a lot more people got hurt. And I say this because there's a lot of money that is flowing right now, uh, taxpayer money, into the financial infrastructure of the country. And many of the same players that took advantage of people over the last few years are thinking creatively of ways to take advantage of them again uh, by accessing some of these, these dollars. So speak to that issue of, of how we can not be caught napping uh, during the transition. We can start with you, Ms. Hillebrand. Um, thank you. I believe you're asking exactly the right question. There will be a danger period during the transition. There are a couple of things and I don't have the whole answer. One is the work that the FTC does right now and continues to do up to that date of the transfer of rulemaking authority will be incredibly important. Uh, it could be up to two years after enactment. If these two titles are enacted together, the FTC will get its rulemaking uh, improvements right away and can, can get some of these rules that have been kind of backlogged because of the limitations on its power moving and into place. That will help, certainly, to, to put those policing into place. Um, we do need to be paying attention to the, the new problems that will be developing. One that worries me in particular is a new form of zombie debt. You know, that's the debt where no one's got the paperwork. Someone just has a list saying you owe this amount that might come out of some of these mortgage um, unsuccessful modifications or, or post kind of mortgage dispositions. So there are, there are new issues, a lot of old issues. The more we can get the FTC to do now before the transfer, I think the better shape it will be in. But um, we will have to watch for that, yes. And the other thing is there, there are, there's not going to be enough enforcement resources. Moving people from where they are over from all the different agencies is not going to give us enough enforcement staff to do the whole job for the country. The FTC has worked very hard. They said they had 100 cases over five years. If you talk to any state AG in the country, they'll tell you 100 cases, we could bring that in my state tomorrow. There's more need than the number of people that are currently in place to do consumer protection enforcement and financial services at the federal level. Yes, sir. Um, I think you need to break your question, which is a great question, into two parts. One part is more scam-like activities. 
Uh, and I think this Congress effectively uh, delegated to the FTC a uh, charge to go after foreclosure rescue scams where a lot of mortgage brokers are moving in and loan modification scams and that kind of thing. That kind of activity, the existing authority clearly is sufficient to regulate and the additional authorities recently given help. You break that from more traditional and large scale sale of products such as mortgages, et cetera. And, and I think in that area, the credit markets are so beaten down that um, I think that this agency would be up and running effectively to get ahead of the new product okay. that would be. That's created. helpful. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> the chair uh, will extend to the members uh, an additional uh, time for uh, one additional question. Uh, and uh, the chair will recognize himself for one additional question. Uh, I want to get back to this area of concurrent enforcement. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I, are there any risks or downsides to consumers or industry with this whole idea of concurrent enforcement uh, between two agencies? I mean, what, what is, do, can you uh, predict or look into a crystal ball and, and, and tell us what you see in terms of downsides or harms to the industry or, or to consumers uh, regarding this whole area of concurrent enforcement? Any, anybody want to jump in? Mr. Steinberg? Well, I'll give it a try to go first. Um, one of the whole things that I think the agency being proposed is, is supposed to do is have single source responsibility. Then you take enforcement and you break that among current enforcement agencies and then you have a new uh, agency uh, that's supposed to be share some type of dual enforcement. It doesn't sound practical to me. I, I, we think that enforcement should continue to stay with the existing agencies. Now, to your question, uh, 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 Congressman, about the, the timing and, and you mentioned the speed limit and, and people watching uh, uh, the, the people going down the road. I think that uh, that I don't think anybody would deny that uh, the regulations or the speed limits were in place, but uh, up until uh, um, several years ago, that uh, perhaps the regulations were in place, but the enforcement and the uh, oversight was not. But I think if you look today in all of these agencies, whether it be the FTC or the other agencies in Washington, I think everybody has their, their radar guns out and are certainly looking at uh, consumer protection issues as well as uh, credit and lending issues in general. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a focus in this area like there is today. Uh, and so to that respect, I think that uh, uh, going back to your question, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that it's very important, I think most important, that there be continued responsibility between safety and soundness and the viability of those companies and consumer protection. And I think it is unwise to separate those two entirely. I mean, we have gone through a good example with the GSEs of trying to do that and finding out why that doesn't work. And it would be very simple if that agency that is just concerned about consumer protection can make everything so safe that it's not really good for the companies offering uh, those products or uh, for the consumers themselves. Uh, there's always going to be risk in this industry that defines what it is. And I don't think you can eliminate that entirely. Okay, you want to... um, I think it's a really Nobody. good question, and I, I, I would say that I think it's not so much of a risk as long as the rules of the game are clear. So, so long as you have the one agency that's setting the rules and what it is that companies have to do, the fact that there would be multiple enforcers of those rules is less disconcerting because you'd have clear standards and everyone would know what they are, and you would essentially have this kind of more cops on the beat 
analogy. And so that's why you could have state AGs helping out, you could have the FTC helping out, you would just be getting more manpower, but the rules would be clear. So really the success of it would depend upon what kind of rules are, are end, end up being produced from this process. And I guess I would just say that's why it works to have, for example, all the states can police Medicaid fraud, for example, and it's, it's not a risk because everybody knows what they're looking for. And so it would just be, um, it would be really important for the agency that's created to have clear rules. And if they see an enforcement action that looks like it's not really in the spirit of those rules, the act as it's written, for example, if the state AG brings it, the CFPA could intervene and they could step into that action and make clear that that's not what's, that's, that's a bad interpretation of their rule or it's a bad enforcement action. So, so I, think it's, I think it's okay to have multiple law enforcers and in fact probably necessary because there just aren't enough resources for all the fraud that's out there. Ms. Hillebrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had to think for a moment about your question to remember that there already are six concurrent enforcing authorities. It's just that the banking agencies haven't used that open public enforcement model to bring cases with the vigor and uh, approach that the FTC has used. So we already do have concurrent enforcement, and the downside has been that the, many of the agencies, other than the FTC, that have enforcement authorities also have other obligations that tie them very close to the industry that they regulate. We'll, at least with the concurrent enforcement authority with the CFPA and the FTC, we won't have that problem, and I think that's a good step forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, concurrent enforcement authority could work if done carefully, but I, I worry that there's too much attention to the FTC as an enforcer. Um, I prepared for this over the weekend when the website was down, uh, so I was reduced to the documents that I happened already to own. Uh, I owned a uh, 2004 annual report. It happened to be in my files. I opened it up to consumer protection, where the FTC has a good list of the range of activities in which the agency engages and that is part of what makes it a success. Consumer protection policy, one research and reports, two, hearings and workshops, three, advocacy, four, amicus briefs, five, consumer and business education and outreach. The FDC is not just a cop on the beat. It is a, an agency that has economists, that does competition, that does consumer protection, and uses a whole range of tools to develop expertise, to identify problems, and to craft solutions. And if a huge part of what the FTC does as a matter of subject matter is transferred out, and if the new agency has the exclusive authority to give guidance in this way, then we've lost a very great deal of what the FTC does, mm -hmm. and I think that the consumers would be uh, the worse for it. Mr. Cox. Uh, Chairman Rush, I, I think ultimately the industry will make two arguments about the concurrent authority and the problems with it. The first is it's too much of enforcement. But as Ms. Hildebrand said, and as someone who spent years making priority lists, your list is way longer than you'll ever get to. And the problem with this bubble certainly wasn't bursting, was not too much enforcement. The second problem, which is more subtle or real, is an inconsistency in enforcement policy. Uh, and Ms. Barco appropriately says uh, that this rulemaking authority, if it's clear, if the rules are clear enough, certainly will we'll solve the, the problem. And I would further say with that, the CFPA is given the sufficient authority to make sure the enforcement is happening in a uniform way. But there's a second response to the inconsistency, which is unlike rulemaking, where I agree you want a unified rulemaker. When it comes to enforcement, this is where regulatory competition actually works because you're competing to be a better enforcer as opposed to a competing for a race to the bottom so that people will charter with you, which was a serious problem in creating this situation. And when you compete to do better, you are aware that if you don't do it and somebody else enforces your rule in a situation that you might get embarrassed, made off SEC, you know, that you, that that when you have competitive enforcement, you have a market that essentially forces public entities to be aware of that. That actually works. And when it comes to UDAP authority, I just want to say, 
It's so important. The state attorneys general, and I'm patting myself on the back here because I was part of a small group who did this. We were the only ones out there screaming about and bringing these cases. The FTC was saying, and it's great because they were going after different actors, but we did one case where we got half a billion dollars back to people with subprime mortgages, household, followed by another case where there was 300 million and I thought that was too little and I'd left by then and I was the hog. So, I mean, this was a problem that if you were on the ground, you saw it. I mean, it was visceral. It was these people are utterly out of control. The state AGs were able to enforce it because they had a different enforcement agenda. They were sitting at a different place. Regulatory competition works in terms of an open enforcement model. Chair, uh, now I recognize uh, Mr. Rodonovitz for one question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate everybody's testimony, but but Mr. Cox, what you sound what I thought I heard was that we need multiple agencies having to do the same job to make sure that the people are doing their job, and that, that to me is a recipe for um, wasted s spending. But I do want to ask you a question about Mrs. I believe it was Miss Sutton who was here earlier talked about a situation where an 84-year-old woman who owned her place free and clear uh, was duped into a 30-year mortgage. I'd like to know whether or not there was family involved putting her up to that, and and that happened. Um, for reasons that wouldn't have anything to do with this current financial crisis. But I happen to represent Stanislaus County in California. It's the epicenter of uh, mortgages, frequently the number one county in the nation where uh, mortgage defaults and foreclosures have happened. So I have a great appreciation for what's happening here. And we had, you'd hear tales about um, uh, one in particular, non-English speaking people that were talked into a home uh, that all they needed to do was come in and sign the papers. Once they got there, they were jammed with points and fees that they knew absolutely nothing about and were put into an uncomfortable situation, signed the mortgage papers, later lost the house. So, so I'm curious to know, after we have spent, in reaction to this financial crisis, anywhere between 800 to one and a half trillion dollars uh, to stimulate the economy, we get no right. You know, we get a we get a rise in the unemployment rate that we're supposed to drop with all that spending. I'm a little leery of broad sweeping uh, uh, reactions to the problems that we're in. So, if, how does something like this? And I'd, I'd offer that to you, Mr. Cox and Mr. Steinberg, and anybody else that wants to respond to this thing. How would that help the person? Uh, I'm not sure about the Sutton case and that. I want to know whether the family put them up to that to that poor, unfortunate uh, uh, elderly person up to that situation. But my situation in Modesto, California, where the non-English speaking person was jammed into that loans and the shyster put points on there and then they quickly sold the mortgage to somebody else and this guy was washing his hands and he was out of there. How does this broad sweeping change that you're talking about prevent something like that from happening? A and at what cost? Any more so than what is currently on the books to, to, to prevent? Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Radonovich. Um, I will respond to that by also responding to Mr. Steinberg's earlier comment that we all agree that the regulation was there, it was an enforcement problem. We don't all agree on that. Um, and, and here's the problem had two parts to it if you want to break it into its grossest problem. The first part was the type of products that were being sold. They were simply way too high risk, way too complex, and way too aggressively sold for average consumers to work through all the problems and understand all the costs and consequences in the context of these mortgages. For instance, the, the, great, uh, the great held up at the time as the, as the great financial innovation, the payment option arm. It was sold so aggressively on its benefits, but its risks were not clear to the average consumer, to my aunt, to, you know, it was, just, it was the kind of thing you, I could have sold her on if I was an evil person without informing her of the risk. So there's a product regulation problem that existed here. The Fed, if you read the Fed's papers during this time and you put them right next to the industry's papers, you could change the titles, you couldn't tell the difference. There was one type of thinking that needs to change. The second problem was a fraud problem. The fraud problem got so far out of control. I've never seen anything like it. You know, if you were at the level, you were talking to the people and you saw what's going on, if you talk to the ex-workers in these agencies, et cetera, and these uh, companies that were selling these things, fraud was so rampant in this industry. 
that, it, you know, that was almost a separate problem from the product regulation problem. And so we also had a lack of enforcement, particularly at the federal level, on that, you know, on fraud. But, but we, we fundamentally had a product regulation problem. I hope that responds. Mr. Stein. <laughs> Uh, commenting back to uh, um, uh, I, Mr. Cox's earlier discussion about whether we should have multiple regulators is a good thing. Uh, um, I ask you if you're a business and you have multiple regulators and two and three regulators, is, is competition really good if you're the regulated entity and the costs that are involved in that. I mean, so the FTC is in your office one week and asking and having your staff gather everything else and the next week, you know, uh, another regulator is in there. I, I can see where, where there might be some contention where that is good, but you won't have businesses that anyone that operates a business, small profit or a large business, which think of having multiple regulators and enforcers coming into your offices is necessarily a good thing because it, it and all of those costs are eventually passed on to consumers. The, the, these do not happen in vacuums. So yes, there are protections I think that need to be in place and, and you're absolutely right about that. But I do think there's, 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 you can overdo a process too. We want to have a process mm -hmm. that protects consumers but is efficient for everyone involved that there's, it's efficient for the safety and soundness of, and the viability of the companies that are being regulated, as well as good for the consumers that are um, uh, buying their, their, their products. And I, and I think that uh, that's an important thing. I just say thank you. What's that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. He's asking for <laughs> the, the chair recognizes the chairman uh, emeritus, uh, Mr. Dingle. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Uh, this question to, um, uh, Gail Hillebrand and to uh, uh, Professor Calkins. Um, what authority will remain in the FTC to protect the consumers after the administration's plan has been adopted, if it's adopted in its current form? Thank you, Chairman Emeritus. The FTC retains all of its authority to bring Section 5 enforcement, subject only to a staff level consultation, coordination, and discussion. Before so it would lose that authority? The FTC retains that authority. I'm going to give you a list of things it retains. Okay. It retains its Section 5 authority. It retains its authority uh, to bring cases under the statutes and rules for the enumerated consumer statutes. That's our alphabet soup, ECOA, EFTA, Reg, Reg Z, and so on. It retains. Um, well, those are big things that it retains. It also retains its pure fraud authority. I mean, there are financial services, and then there are people who tell lies, who say, sign up with me and give me your Social Security number and you know, your checking account number, and you'll never see me again. It retains that authority. Those folks are not selling financial services. They're, they're selling lies. It retains that authority. Um, and we have recommended that it also be given uh, the same kind of backstop authority that it now, uh, ha now has currently and would have under this proposal for the existing consumer statutes with respect to enforcement of the CFPA rules. That is not yet in the proposal. All right, now what would it lose? What would FTC lose? What consumer protection jurisdiction would it lose? Yes, the FTC would lose a jurisdiction that has been difficult for it to use, which is its important but difficult for it to use, which is its authority to develop unfair and deceptive acts and practices rules in the financial services area. I'm sure you're aware the last time that authority was used was in the credit practices rule, which came into effect in the mid-1980s. Okay, now why should that be taken away from FTC? If we were looking at just the FTC, there'd be no reason to take it away. But the problem is we need... Right, uh, the, now, there's no reason to take it away. No, I'm not quite... Now let's, 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 let's just go a wee bit further and explain to me why we should give it to some of those good-hearted folk who led the fight for the repeal of Glass-Steagall, who deregulated banking and financial services, and who left us this glorious mess, which we now have in the form of probably the biggest depression that this country has had since 1929. Now, why should we do that? We need to give that authority to an agency that can make one set of rules that applies to the bank provider 
and the non-bank provider. If the I, have FTC no, I have no objection to taking care of the bank regulatory agencies. Let them do, let them create them and let them do their thing. But why wouldn't we want the honest men and women at FTC looking over their shoulder? And why wouldn't we want them looking over the shoulder of those good-hearted banks and financial folks and MBAs up in New York that created this mess. Now, now help me, why wouldn't we want that? We, we definitely want oversight. We want somebody who can look over no you, matter what kind of- You like the idea of having of the FTC sort of keep an eye on those people? We like the idea of having an agency that can look at everybody, not just the non-bank providers, keep an eye. And we think the best way well, to do about, that is to put it all in one place. What about the good-hearted banks that are gonna be engaging in all kinds of things? They're going to be engaging in real estate. They're going to be engaging in issuing of bonds and securities. They're going to be engaged in all kinds of wonderful activities on derivatives, which are really gambling devices. Uh, so why shouldn't the FTC do its, retain its, continue, its continuing and ancient jurisdiction over keeping honest men honest, and maybe occasionally catching a rascal. Now, why should we take that away from the FTC? Mr. Uh, you, Chairman Emeritus, you're, I you respectfully suggest you it's You represent because consumers. Why shouldn't we just leave FTC as it is and, 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 and let these other folk go about their nefarious business under the kind of weak-minded regulation that the Treasury has traditionally given? to these institutions. We're absolutely now, give me a in good favor reason of for that. I, 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 you're, you're speaking here for the consumers and I'm trying to figure out, do you really understand the consumer's needs or are you engaged in perhaps disregarding the consumers because uh, these other folks have done a better job of telling you what a wonderful job they're gonna do after they have brought about not one but two depressions. I'm looking at it from the point of view of the ordinary person who's trying to get a mortgage. And they want to know, I mean, here's, the consumer doesn't think it's TILA, no, no, RESPA, no, no. You're, it's sales practices, you're but there's no federal rule answer, on that. But it's to the wrong question. Answer my question, please. Um, the answer is we think why that- should we not, Why should we not keep FTC in its traditional jurisdiction of protecting consumers? When I was a boy, Roosevelt tried to give FTC jurisdiction over the stock market. And you can't imagine the outrage that this generated in New York because they were scared to death of the Federal Trade Commission, which is under jurisdiction of this committee. We keep them honest. And, 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 and we find that as soon as the SEC got away from this committee, they all of a sudden became a wholly owned subsidiary of the securities industry and the banking industry. Now, why should we sanctify that by, by stripping the consumers of the one remaining protection which they have, the FTC, in, in favor of giving it to a congregation of folks well known to be influenced by some of the worst scoundrels in our society? Are you ready for my answer? Um, we believe that we need to put it in one place so that the non-banks aren't saying, oh, don't regulate us because the banks can still do that. And the banks but aren't saying, oh, don't, don't regulate us because the other guy can still do we it. We don't mind having this agency that would be created by the administration's proposal to do that. What we want is to have the FTC there so as to sort of watch over these people and let them know that, there's, that there are honest men and women watching them so that the rascality is diminished and the consumers are protected. What's wrong with that? I think we have the same goal and perhaps a difference of perspective about how to get there. We think it will be so, difficult so, to get there so without then having are one you, agency. Are you telling me that you like the idea of having the FTC continue its jurisdiction while these other good-hearted folk go about their nefarious business? We have endorsed full retention of FTC enforcement authority, but we think you've Dear got to friend, put all the rules in we one place. We have talked about what FTC is going to lose, and you are apparently advocating the losing of it. I am not of a view that maybe we want FTC to lose that jurisdiction 
And maybe we want FTC to be around to sort of provide a minor dampening of the rascality which is going to continue to occur in the financial services industry. Now, what is your objection to that? We believe that if the, you need your to put friend, the rules... In, in just sorry. a few words, what is your objection? Put the rulemaking in one place so that it's very clear whose job it is, okay. and then you can hold them accountable to do they it. Did, they, they arranged that one-stop shopping when they moved this whole thing across the hall. And since then, the whole financial services industry of the United States has had to be bailed out to the amount of $700 billion, which was congregated by uh, Mr. Paulson, who came from that industry, and which, and, and which uh, has done nothing but enrich the same rascals that caused the trouble. And it has not only enriched those rascals, but it has given us something new to think about, and that is it has seen to it that they've had the funds to pay the same scoundrels who made the mess enormous bonuses amounting to as much as $165 million in one instance. This is the product of one-stop shopping, which I suspect you are telling me you support, or maybe you want to tell me now you don't support. We are trying to end the ability to shop for your regulator by having one entity write the rules, no matter what kind of charter, uh, what kind of provider. That, that's our position. Well, I have to say, I think somebody else wrote your statement, but I thank you for your presence. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courage and ability in bringing this event about. Thank you. The chair thanks the chairman and Meredith. Uh, the chair thanks the witnesses. Uh, this is uh, this hearing is now stands uh, adjourned. Uh, but before we adjourn, I really wanted to let you know how grateful we are for you to uh, extend your time with us and spend your time with us. Uh, by unanimous, unanimous consent, I request that the members submit all questions to be sent to the witnesses for the record within seven calendar days, and the witnesses will respond promptly to the questions that are submitted to them. Thank you so very much, and uh, safe travel. Public Affairs Programming on C-SPAN 2. Up next...